Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host. In life, unrelated to one's social standing or class as determined by man, there are some people who, by nature, are keys that set the world in motion. They are the true elite, as dictated by the golden rule of the universe. That's what I want to know. What is my place in the world? Who am I? What am I capable of? What am I destined for? These words, spoken by a mere boy of around 20 years of age, sound wise beyond his years. But turns out, they were our first warning signs of an ambition that would end up destroying countless lives and change the face of the earth. Technically, these words were the conclusion of the first piece of dialogue we ever received from Griffith, and while Kentaro Miura was pretty much coming up with stuff on the fly back in those days, we'd say this is one character description he nailed on the head early on. The Falcon of Light, as he's known by his subject these days, feels like the Jesus Christ of Berserk. He died and was reincarnated with prophetic powers, and then manifested into the physical world as a miracle worker without peer. But the truth of his nature lies in the prophecy of the Falcon, which correctly labels him as the Falcon of Darkness. Because as pretty and precise as he might seem on the outside, Griffith is a tumultuous storm of emotions and desire on the inside. And his incapability to handle those emotions is what ends up turning the world of Berserk upside down. So today, we're going to take a deep dive into the entire life of Griffith, from his birth, through his childhood as an orphan, all the way up to his current existence as an all-powerful god on earth in service of evil. But before we do that, we have a small request. If you enjoy our content, please give this video a massive thumbs up, share it with your friends and smash that subscribe button with the notification bell turned to all while you're at it. It helps us create the content that you love and bring in more marvellous viewers like you. Now, let's get into it. The birth circumstances of Berserk's biggest enigma, exploring Griffith's mysterious childhood. People like to think that childhood circumstances don't play a major role in the development of a person's thought processes and ideologies, but just look at Guts. If you've ever seen our entire Life of Guts video, you'll know that his cursed childhood, which was plagued with hatred and warfare, ended up shaping him into the fearsome black swordsman he is today. So is the case with most of us, whether we like it or not, and so is the case with Griffith. Except with him, we don't really know anything about his childhood, apart from what he's told us himself. Kentaro Miura was intentionally avoidant when it came to explaining Griffith's backstory and inner thoughts, because he felt that the ambiguity worked a lot better for his character. Other people's perceptions of Griffith within the story, and the reader's recognition of a dissonance between that and the truth, is what creates this sense of impending doom in the second half of Berserk. The first half is all about setting up Guts and Griffith's relationship, and what changed in that dynamic for the latter to become an all-powerful demon. So it's frustrating that we don't have the details on Griffith's childhood to give you guys an all-out, marvellous anime-style dissection of it. But we are going to talk about how odd that is instead, because it's rather strange that the only thing we know for sure about his childhood is that A. He acquired his lifelong dream during that period of time in his life, and B. Someone named him Griffith. Let's talk about the second point first. Because, like we've told you guys a few moments ago, Kentaro Miura was an extremely intentional mangaka. He makes deliberate choices when coming up with the names for his characters, territories, magical creatures, <laughs> you name it. Puck is called Puck because he's supposed to be analogous to Puck from British folklore and myth. Dibus Bishasa Ghana are called by that name because it's the closest thing to demonic beasts you're going to find in the Hindi language. Hell, Guts is called Guts because his name is a reflection of his personality and his birth circumstances. He was born from his mother's hanging corpse, and it was a miracle he didn't choke to death on her guts on his way out. Plus, if you've seen him fight, you know the boy doesn't lack in the courage department. This intentionality is continued with Griffith, whose name is especially reflective of his ambitions and desires in life. The name Griffith comes from the old Welsh word Grufford, which translates to strong chief, strong lord, or even prince. You can see why Miura would choose such a name for a character that was destined to rule the world. Miura Sensei stated in interviews that he pretty much made up the motivation for Guts and Griffith's rivalry as he was penning the Black Swordsman arc, so it's safe to say that Griffith's backstory wasn't much of a focus in his name choosing. But we love headcanoning things on this channel, so uh, this is our headcanon for how Griffith got his name. These are the only details available to us about Griffith's childhood. He was an orphan who grew up extremely poor, living on the streets of a nameless city. Sometimes he couldn't even afford a loaf of bread to feed himself, and his only victories came in the form of small trinkets and junk he won from his fellow street urchins, playing street games. One day, as the afternoon sun was setting, Griffith set his eyes upon the castle that overlooked the cobbled streets that were his home, and he decided that he wanted that thing. Dazzling in his eye like a far-fetched dream, Griffith couldn't have been more than ten years of age when he made up his mind to acquire that thing, and that vision would end up informing every life decision he made from that point forward. Okay, so... What can we understand about his childhood from these details? A few things. The first being, Griffith definitely grew up somewhere in the Western Hemisphere of Berserk. How can we tell that? Well, just by looking at the architecture of the buildings in and around him when he reflects on his past. 
it looks like a classic medieval European city, which has nothing in common with Wyndham or Vritanis, by the way. Many people think Griffith was born in the Midland capital, but that assumption can be dispelled by taking one look at the design of the castle that inspired his dream. The Midland Royal Castle is far grander in scope and scale, and Vritanis' architectural design is entirely different. You could say this place looks a lot like Coker, the city Guts visits in the first chapter of Berserk Burner. Once again, that would be speculation. What isn't speculation, though, is that Griffith grew up in the West, probably in a city with a lot of Holy See influence. Who named him is not known, but what is quite intriguing is that this orphan kid knows how to read and write. As far as we know, Griffith wasn't part of any orphanage, and literacy was a noble trait besides. If he was truly parentless, it's possible he taught himself how to read and write, and gave himself the name Griffith once he found out its meaning, which would be incredibly impressive. Or there could be another reason for the same, which we'll discuss in a bit, so stay tuned. The second thing we can tell is that Griffith has always had an obsession with winning. Even in his recollection of his childhood memories, all Griffith truly recalls as being valuable are his trinkets that he won, not the friends that he played with. This one-track mentality towards victory is something that would bring him a lot of success later on in life, but also become the reason for his downfall, because he can't stand the idea of losing. And the last thing we learn is, well, for a street urchin, Griffith is a bit too pretty, wouldn't you say? The silver locks, the heart-shaped face, those piercing falcon's eyes, everything about him screams nobility, even the way he carries himself. You could never tell Griffith was a commoner until it was pointed out to you, which in itself is a, an odd notion to have. What proof is there that Griffith is in fact low-born? The words of a few jealous men, and Griffith's own knowledge of his past, which, considering that he was a very young child when he was orphaned, can't be relied upon entirely. So, is Griffith a lost nobleman that happened to grow up as an orphan? There's a possibility that this is the case. In the deleted chapter 83, when Griffith meets the only verified godlike entity in Berserk, he's told that history itself was manipulated to get him to that point. Bloodlines were mixed, events were coordinated, and decisions were swayed to ensure Griffith would be born and he would do the things he did in life as a human being. What's interesting here is that this godlike entity specified the fact that bloodlines were manipulated to ensure Griffith's birth. This leads us to believe that his birth circumstances were, in fact, special. Bloodline confusions exist all across the board in the story of Berserk. The mystery of Guts's mother is one that remains unresolved. The Midland royal family claims to be descended from the ancient king Geyseric, but there's no evidence for the same. The Herald Serpico is Farnese's half-brother, but she doesn't know it. And we keep thinking Griffith is a commoner, because we've been told he's a commoner. It's possible that said bloodline manipulation has led to a commoner being born to fulfill causality's purpose. But it'd be far more interesting if it came out that Griffith was, in fact, a noble. That'd make a lot of what he does in order to become a king feel as redundant as what he does to the world later on, adding a layer of extra irony to his quest for control. Kentaro Miura deleted this chapter from the continuity because he felt as though it explained too much about his story that he didn't want explained so early on, and that was likely also a reference to the revelations about Griffith's backstory, in addition to all the stuff about causality that was info dumped, of course. A noble background would explain all of Griffith's character traits, but if his behavior and his intellect were self-cultivated and self-honed, then that makes his childhood all the more impressive. Because right after he acquired his dream, Griffith got to work on bringing it to life, and that's where his comrades come into the mix. The boyhood dream begins in earnest, but it isn't all smiles. The early years of the Band of the Falcon. Wanting to become a king as a child is a fine dream to have, but to actually get to work on making that dream a reality requires aptitude far beyond a child's years. And it turns out, Griffith possessed said aptitude in spades. Even as far back as being an adolescent, he knew that acquiring a castle wasn't going to be as simple as besieging it and taking over. He had an idea of what kind of ruler he wanted to be. He knew he had to win over one of the biggest kingdoms in the world and with merit and legal authority, so none could challenge his claim, as opposed to brute force which would definitely get him killed. So he got to work on optimizing every aspect of his being that was going to serve his dream. Like we mentioned in that previous section, Griffith had learnt how to read and write himself, most likely, but what we didn't mention was his approach toward knowledge. He believed that in order to become great, one must possess a vast amount of knowledge on a vast number of topics. So, he'd educate himself on things like world history, politics, arts, cultures, fashion, even offbeat topics like cooking and the erotic arts. Not at that age, you perverts, but later on in life, when he needed to work his magic. He taught himself swordplay and became one of the greatest fighters the world had ever seen, this side of Midland. His skill with a sabre was unrivaled, and his strategies as a commander unparalleled. Griffith became a one-man army in all but name, but he knew he couldn't fight all his battles by his lonesome. So, he got to work on creating an army that could do that for him, the Band of the Falcon. Griffith was barely a man grown when he started his little mercenary group. Some sources cite him being as young as 14, 
But even at that age, Griffith's natural charisma and magnetism swayed ambitious people to his cause. The Band of the Falcon started off as a small-time gang of thieves, comprised of the leader Griffith. The powerhouse miner turned mercenary Pippin, the veteran thief and all-round sourpuss Corcus, as well as the jack-of-all-trades and master of some Judo. At first, they were looting rich nobles and raiding their caravans to make off with whatever they could, but this wasn't because Griffith was trying to be Robin Hood. He was gathering war funds to start a large standing army, with his personal aim being to make it the best army in the world. He openly told his men that his dream was to become king, and he'd give up everything he needed to give up in order to achieve that. He was admirable and confident in his strategies, which had a funny way of working out all the time. He was playful and childish in his quieter moments, and when the occasion called for it, he could be as stern as a seasoned chieftain. Griffith had the mental aptitude of a veteran politician at the age of a princeling, and this aura of maturity and confidence that radiated off of him is what drew most people to his service. To his credit, Griffith was a far better mercenary leader than most that were active at that time, but every great man starts off somewhere humble and unsavory, and Griffith's origins as a leader were rooted in the time he spent attacking and stealing from rich nobles. It was during one of these caravan raids that he came across a person who would transform his ragtag bunch of thieves into a proper disciplined army, Casca. One day, Griffith and his men came across a nobleman trying to assault a young girl in a field. The place was remote and often saw conflict, so this kind of thing was sadly not new. It's possible that Griffith's crew was tailing the noblemen in question precisely because they wanted to loot him, because that's what they end up doing in the aftermath of that entire situation. But during it, Griffith displays his own nobility, or shall we say, his distaste for that concept. When he sees the nobleman about to violate Casca, he slices off the man's ear and pointedly asks him whether being a noble meant he was chosen by God. In that moment, the young girl thought that she was going to be helped by this knight in shining armor. Instead, he threw her his sword and told her to defend herself as she had something to live for, something to fight for. Casca fought back almost on instinct and killed the nobleman in one motion when he fell on the sword. Her hands were shaking. She couldn't quite process that she'd just taken a life. The guilt was about to overwhelm her, even though she was the one who was about to get violated when Griffith held her hand and brought peace to her mind. He told her she was free to do as she pleased with her life, and Casca chose to join Griffith. Corcus told her that they were going to become a proper war band sooner rather than later, and that her life would be at risk every living moment. But Casca didn't care, because she'd come to see Griffith as the savior who gave her a sword when she needed it the most. So she joined up with the band, and quickly rose through the ranks, becoming second in command and their second best fighter after Griffith. With his wits and her hot-headed organizational skills, the band quickly went from being raiders to a proper mercenary group with scores upon scores of members. Griffith started getting mercenary contracts for his services, and with his military genius, he was able to find employment with one of the wealthiest Tudor nobles there was, a man by the name of Genin. And this is where the ugly side of Griffith's pursuit of his dream rears its head. Everything we hear about Griffith's time with Genin comes from Casca's perspective, and at this point in the story, she was deeply in love with him. So we have to take whatever she says with a pinch of salt and judge Griffith's time under Genin's employment based on his actions alone. And his actions alone revealed that he wasn't so much concerned with what happened to his men as he was with how it reflected on himself and his own psyche. Genin had a reputation for being a child abuser. His court was littered with wide-eyed young boys, all of whom had nothing but fear driving their daily lives. Griffith was aware of this man's reputation, and he still chose to work for him. Casca didn't exactly question why this was the case because she was content with finding meaning in her life through her success as a warrior. When she stepped into Genin's court, she shuddered upon seeing those kids because she'd nearly suffered a similar fate not too long ago. Griffith saw this and quickly neutralized her fears with a hand on her shoulder and his trademark warm smile. But why did no one question his association with Genin there and then? It's because everyone else was hungry for action, and Casca wasn't thinking with a brain. Mercenaries have limited options for employment as it is, and when a person sells their sword for a living, they tend to take whatever opportunity fills up their coffers in favor of sticking to things like ideals. If she had been, she'd have understood immediately why Griffith was spending the night in Genin's chambers when she stumbled across the two of them one evening. The next morning, she found Griffith bathing in a stream, as if trying to cleanse himself of the shame of the previous night. Casca sees him and tries to turn back, but Griffith calls her out and asks her to join him. He starts off by claiming the water was too nice to ignore, but then comes to the point and asks her if she thinks he's unclean. Griffith knows Casca gets tongue twisted around him, but he also knows she isn't stupid. Sooner or later, she was going to ask him about it, so he got it out in the open the first chance he got. Casca asked him why he slept with Genin despite knowing his reputation and what he does to little boys. And Griffith's first response was, money. He went on to explain his reasoning with perfect adult logic. Wars cost more money than they make, 
In Griffith's small time band had no way of competing with the bigger mercenary units in the world if they didn't get a massive cash infusion, and quick. Griffith chose to serve Genon because he knew of the Tudor nobleman's depraved tastes and used it against him to satisfy his own agenda. Genon would remember that one night with Griffith for years to come, and we don't say this as a phrase, this literally happens in the series. In exchange for such an awesome time, he gave Griffith all the money he needed, and <laughs> then some, and it was going to be put to use to bring the Band of the Falcon into theatres of war where casualties actually meant something. This is where we get the true insight into Griffith's mentality behind all these movements, at least from Casca's perspective. Because she saw Griffith with Genin, the two of them had visited one of the battlefields they fought on under his collars to bid farewell to a fallen falcon. He was a small boy, no older than the age Griffith had been when he first dreamt his dream, and yet he lay there now, lifeless. Casca didn't know anything about the kid, but Griffith had asked Pippin to ring him the boys' gathering so he could give him the closest thing to a proper funeral. Turns out, the only thing that was left of the boys' belongings was a little toy knight. This reminded Griffith of the times he would gaze at the White Falcon, his eyes filled with emotion as though he were watching his hero. Griffith wondered out loud whether this kid died living his dream, or whether the Falcon's dream is what killed the boy. Casca took this to mean that Griffith was grieving over this kid's passing, but in reality, Griffith felt no responsibility for that whatsoever. When Casca asks him if the money is to reduce casualties because of the boy that they buried a few days ago, Griffith flat out rejected that notion. He blatantly stated that he applied cold logic to the situation. To lose hundreds of comrades in order to build up his mercenary band bit by bit, or to seduce one old man and cause rapid growth, which is better? Griffith has never felt responsible for or remorse over the death of a single soldier in his service, because to him, they died fighting for a cause they chose to serve. Griffith never compelled anyone to join him, so he didn't feel attached to their lives in any way, shape, or form. He was very aware of the fact that his dream could only be reached through a blood-smeared path of corpses, so attachment was likely an option he killed in the womb for himself. But if there was one thing he could do to honor the dead, it was to win. He would keep winning until he had his dream in his grasp, because in his mind, these people died for that dream as well. Above all, he felt it unfair that he alone remained unclean in this filthy conquest. So, out of that sense of guilt, he rationalized sleeping with Genin to himself and Casca. As he was saying all this, Griffith had started clawing into his arms because his grip over his own sanity was getting looser. Casca is right in saying that Griffith shoulders a burden far greater than others because he's trying to realize a dream most people keep restricted to their imaginations. She recognized the toll it took on him when she saw him dig into his own flesh like that, and that gruesome sight, coupled with her own feelings for him, were what made her decide to become the sword with which he claimed his throne. But if we're looking at this from Griffith's perspective, sleeping with Genin was a shortcut he was forced to take, but he personally didn't want to do it. It was evident from the moment he asked Casca if he was dirty. Griffith knew that, as a commoner, morality was not something he could afford to toy with if he wanted to become a king one day, and yet he was disgusted with himself at the same time. He was perfectly fine with letting people die for him, but he wasn't okay being the clean one. These contradictions in Griffith's outlook on life only spilled out in front of Casca because he was in a vulnerable spot. When she ran up to him and asked him to stop, Griffith realized what he'd done and immediately reverted to his cheerful, confident leader persona to calm her down. This momentary slip of the mask shows you just what kind of an emotional tempest Griffith is on the inside. He's justifying his own decisions with a sense of self-righteousness that doesn't exist because he's selling himself to a pedophile to get what he wants. Turns out, making your dreams come true isn't as dreamy as it seems, and that amongst his brilliance and battle results, it's quite easy to forget that Griffith is still a boy. He's essentially skipped the adolescence phase and gone straight to adulthood, which will end up having devastating consequences later. But for now, Griffith has the determination, and after Genin, the money, to start the real work on making his dream a reality. That's when he comes across the man that changes him forever, without him even noticing it. Guts. The day that changed Griffith without him knowing. The White Falcon meets and recruits Guts. The Band of the Falcon grew to around 500 members during the time they spent under Genin's patronage, which were enough men for Griffith to start courting major kingdoms for vassalage. During his time searching for the right kingdom to infiltrate and take over, Griffith added many new names to his band. There was the boy blacksmith Rickett, who was as good with crafting weapons as he was innocent and free-spirited, especially in his early years. There was Gaston, who would go on to become the second-in-command of Griffith's raiders unit in the years to come. Then there was Bazuso, the mighty Grey Knight who was legendary for having taken down 30 men in a single fight. He was arguably Griffith's most effective heavy after Pippin, especially because he fought with a battle axe as big as a regular human being. But the man who would turn the Falcon's life upside down is the same guy who takes out his best heavy in a siege that lasted way longer than it should have. <laughs> you guessed it, 
guts. The first time Griffith laid eyes upon the future Black Swordsman, it was during a siege that both sides hadn't anticipated would last this long. For Guts' side, the mission was supposed to last only three days. For Griffith, it was going to last as long as he needed it to, unless he could root out the enemy as quickly as possible. It ended up enduring for three months, and ended when Guts killed Bazuso in a one-on-one -on -one duel, which high-ranking falcons like Judo, Caucus and Griffith himself happened to be watching. All of them were mightily impressed by the young swordsman's skills, but they knew that with Bazuso down, it was time to leave. Call it coincidence or causality, but their paths converged once again when Guts happened to be passing by a cliffside the Falcons were camping out on. He was attacked by the pot stirrer that is Corcus, because 1. Corcus wanted to rob Guts, and 2. Corcus wanted the rep boost that would come with killing the killer of Bazuso. But it became clear rather quickly that he picked a fight he couldn't hope to win. When Corcus first expressed his interest in attacking Guts, Griffith just let him do as he pleased. When things started getting out of hand, he sent Casca to sort it out as his second-in-command. But when she didn't come back, Griffith took charge of the situation himself and came across the best recruit he was ever going to have. The White Falcon confronted the lone swordsman on horseback, fully armored, with every imaginable advantage within his grasp. And yet, Guts didn't back down from his challenge. Instead, he dared Griffith to charge at him, which he gladly did, stabbing Guts in a vital spot that incapacitated him for three days. During this time, he sent Casca to make sure Guts didn't freeze to death due to blood loss because apparently it was a woman's duty to keep a man warm. But when he wasn't being casually misogynistic, he was thinking about the way Guts fought. Griffith didn't just dive into his fight with Guts blindly and come out smelling like roses. No, he took some time to observe his opponent, and what he saw was a sense of desperation, not unlike his own ambition to become king. Griffith recognized the fact that Guts had a habit of verifying his own existence through each battle he survived, which is why he took every challenge, no matter how dangerous, head on like a bull. The White Falcon felt an unspoken kinship with him because of that mentality, because, in a way, Griffith was also constantly betting everything he had with every move he made. Unlike the rest of his troops, the Band of the Falcon was the only vehicle to securing his dream. Everything they did was an extension of his own goals, and consequently, everything he decided for them shaped all of their lives. And the risk of death was constant in his line of work, so identifying with that aspect of Guts was easy for him. Griffith decided that he wanted to recruit Guts, which was a shocking thing for him to say out loud because, according to Casca, he had never said something like that, at least not in her time as a Falcon. Guts initially took it to mean something entirely different, but once Griffith clarified he was talking about recruitment, the two warriors came to an agreement. They would have a proper duel, and if Griffith won, Guts would join the Falcons. But if Guts won, he'd give Griffith a hole in his chest to match the one on his own. What followed was a prime example of Griffith at his peak as an active fighter. We rarely see Griffith fight in a proper battle in the series. In fact, his only extended fight sequences are with Guts, and the first of these is a doozy of a victory for the White Falcon. To check out more about the battles in particular, check out our Guts vs Griffith video because we go into this topic in way more detail over there. But the gist of it is, Griffith uses his slender frame and superior mobility to completely outclass Guts, forcing the Black Swordsman to join his ranks. Guts' willingness to fight dirty and go all out on every occasion made Griffith trust him even more on an implicit basis, and he assigned the Swordsman rear guard duty on his first night as a Falcon. The importance of the role and the astonishment of it being handed to a complete newcomer was not lost on any of the veteran Falcons, but what astonished them even more was the extent to which Griffith went to in order to see Guts come back safely. For his part, Guts was awestruck by Griffith's meticulous planning. The raid was conducted at night time, and the band used a stream to cover their approach. The White Falcon had even taken weather forecast into account while planning the assault, and the actual raiding part of their operation went without a hitch. Guts had heard of the band's fearsome reputation, but now he was seeing the reason behind it in full effect, and he was sold at least on the efficiency of their planning. He decided to fulfill his role as rear guard in earnest as well, and for the most part, he succeeded. Guts even saved little Rickett from nearly getting killed while the Falcons were retreating, and at one point, he was holding off two columns of cavalry all by himself. His duty as rear guard was to hold off the enemy till the retreat was complete, and he knew life expectancy was low for this particular job description. But just as the enemy closed in around him, Griffith returned, saved Guts, and drove off the pursuers with cannon fire. This was out of character for the White Falcon, because he'd never directly risked his life for someone like that. But in Griffith's mind, the risk was worth it because of the asset that Guts was to him. After that first successful raid, Griffith invited Guts to take a morning bath with him as a bonding experience. When the two boys were done water fighting, a 
Guts 1, by the way, Griffith ended up spilling the entire summary of his life's quest to this unfamiliar swordsman. The White Falcon showed him his precious talisman, which he'd received from an old fortune teller back when he was a street urchin. According to that lady, this crimson behelot would one day give him the world in exchange for his flesh, and while Griffith didn't quite understand what that meant, he took it as a good luck charm for himself. Little did he know how literal that woman's words were going to become, but for now, he had to sell his most important prospective asset on his grandiose ass dream. He laid down his ambition to become a king in his own right in front of Guts, and told him that he now owned the swordsman, and would decide the day he was to die. The foreshadowing those words set up are ominous to say the least, but after seeing what he'd seen, Guts couldn't deny Griffith's ability to bring his crazy vision to life. After his exemplary performance as rear guard, Griffith gave Guts command of ten men within two weeks of being a falcon, and thus began the legend of Raider Captain Guts. During their three-year association before the main storyline of Berserk picks up, Guts and Griffith managed to carve out an even fiercer reputation for the Band of the Falcon than before. Where they'd previously been undefeated, they were now unstoppable, and a lot of that was down to Guts' sheer strength as a swordsman. That opening dialogue we used in the intro of the video came from the aftermath of one of the battles they fought during those three years. Griffith would always marvel at how Guts managed to survive even the most fatalistic of circumstances. He thought Guts had the luck of the devil, and then told him about his true ambitions in life. Griffith later remarked that it was funny he was saying all this, because it was the first time he'd spoken of himself so openly with someone. But he failed to realize that what he was nurturing here was essentially the best friendship he was ever going to have. Griffith came to rely on Guts to the point he started planning around his impulsive actions, where previously he'd just have everyone blindly stick to his winning strategy. It didn't matter how far Guts strayed from the original plan because, well, one, he was an ace warrior who could take out entire units himself, and two, Griffith was Sun Tzu reincarnate. His reading of a battlefield was second to none. So, even if Guts went off script, Griffith could fill in the gaps by adjusting his strategies. Their relationship became codependent in a way neither of them realized before it was too late. On two separate occasions, Guts would ask Griffith why he risked his life to save a common soldier like him, the first time we've already discussed with the rear guard retreat. Back then, Griffith gave him the standard spiel of not wanting to lose his best soldier. The second time was after the pair survived their first encounter with the immortal one, Nosferatu Zod. That fight proved to Griffith that entities beyond the current understanding of humans do exist, and that maybe that fortune teller's talk about him getting the world in exchange for his flesh wasn't a bunch of bull. But then he also tells Guts that he didn't need a reason to save his life, because Griffith did jump in front of quite possibly the strongest apostle in existence, just to save his buddy's skin. Once again, neither man verbalizes the bond that they have and that they were so clearly trying to preserve. But for the time being, it was blossoming was in fact one of the centerpieces of Griffith's plan to secure his throne. The princess, the ball, and the plan to win it all. Griffith's grand scheme to secure his throne. After gauging interest from many kingdoms and taking into account the political situation of each of them, Griffith decided that the best play to make would be to target the throne of Midland. The Kingdom of Midland had been stuck in a century-long war with Tudor, and had no hope of winning ever since they lost the key fortress of Daldry to the enemy. Griffith had already served on the Tudor side during his time with Genin, so he knew them well, and given Midland's considerable lack of resources and competent leadership, he felt as though hiring out his services to them would give him the best shot at getting his own kingdom. He spent a few months securing multiple key victories for Midland with his independent mercenary status. But after the Falcons swept over Tudor's elite, 35 troops strong, Black Ram Iron Lance Heavy Cavalry Division with a seventh of the numbers, the King could no longer hold off ennobling Griffith for his efforts. Following that victory, Griffith was knighted and named a Viscount of the Kingdom of Midland, which granted him peerage amongst nobility. Many in the throne room were skeptical of Griffith, a commoner, being lavished with such an important title, but none could deny his merit. The veteran Falcons on his team knew what this meant for their promotion from mercenaries to actual army soldiers, but to Griffith, this was the true first step toward realizing his dream. Up until now, the purpose of the Band of the Falcon had been to showcase his prowess as a military leader. He targeted a kingdom with weak military leadership and gave them important victories in a long-drawn conflict, because he knew the ripple effect it would have for him politically. Now that he was at peerage, he was officially allowed to court nobles and attend other formal events, which brings us to the next step of his plan, marrying the princess. Griffith is a guy that likes to do his research down to the last minute detail before making his plans, so it'd be foolish of us to assume he didn't know about Princess Charlotte. He was also very aware of the effect his looks had on women around him, so he decided to use a combination of his natural charm and political assassination to ensure Charlotte didn't fall in anyone else's hands. As the sole issue of the King of Midland, Charlotte was the heir to the throne. Whoever married her would effectively become the next King of Midland. Griffith was aware of this, 
and also the competition, which included the king's nephew, Adonis. Adonis's father, Julius, had already made himself Griffith's enemy by belittling him for being a commoner in front of the princess, which saw the band of the falcon replace Julius's white dragon knights. The white falcon knew what must be done. Though he was saved by his mysterious blood-red charm necklace, Griffith wasn't the type to put his faith entirely in fate. He was extremely perceptive and could tell there was a conspiracy afoot to take him out. He'd figured out Count Julius was a part of this conspiracy, but he needed the full picture as soon as possible. The King of Midland was giving him unprecedented importance in his war plans and ideas for the future of the kingdom, and it was going to be crucial for Griffith to secure his position in the court whilst taking out all potential threats. So he plans to assassinate Julius, suss out who else was working with him, and take those people out as well, once he's done recovering the lost fortress of Doldry for Midland. In between all this, he would continue to put the moves on Prince Charlotte until eventually she gave in to his charm. From the moment he met her, Griffith knew that she was interested in him, and during the autumn hunt, he ensured they got closer as he personally escorted her around the hunting grounds and, quote, unquote, saved her from an assassination attempt. His main tool in achieving these goals was going to be none other than Guts, because despite having spent more time fighting beside the rest of his unit commanders, Griffith felt the closest to Guts. He felt as though the two shared a mutual understanding of the ugly truth of this world and how some things just needed to be done in order to get where one wanted to be. So Griffith entrusted the duty of assassinating Count Julius to Guts, confident that the swordsman would not let him down. He was elated when he learnt his assassin had also killed his direct courtship rival Adonis, even if it was by accident, and Guts was also key to eliminating Griffith's competition post-Battle of Doldry. Before departing for that fight, Griffith was able to deduce that Minister Foss was connected to Count Julius's plot to assassinate him. So, when he returned, he had Guts assist him with kidnapping Foss's daughter, so he could squeeze out the names of everyone else conspiring to kill him in the royal court. Griffith then proceeded to kill all of those people, including the Queen of Midland, by setting ablaze the tower they gathered in for their secret meetings. After that, he intimidated Foss into working with him, and then had Guts kill the kidnappers he'd enlisted so word of their deeds never fell on unwanted ears. Throughout all this, Griffith expressed to Guts his doubts regarding whether the path he was taking was the right one, but the swordsman reinforced his beliefs by telling him if it was in pursuit of his dream, then it was correct. As for the Battle of Doldry itself, Griffith proved a strategic genius by recapturing a fortress that was said to be impregnable in his first planned assault. The King of Midland had tried to retake Doldry several times in the years they lost control of it to Tudor, but even their elite white tiger knights were unable to put a dent in its defenses. Once again, call it coincidence or causality, but the man in charge of Doldry when Griffith assaulted it was Genin, and the White Falcon took complete advantage of their previous relationship to secure his victory. Griffith split his forces into two, sent one half to recapture the fortress, while the other half was supposed to fend off the Tudor advance until their death. Things got a little hairy when Guts' sword snapped while he was facing off against Genin's best man, Bascone, but Griffith was able to spot a replacement sword for him quick enough to ensure victory was his. To find out more about why Guts vs. Boscon is one of the most important fights in all of Berserk, check out our video on that from our Berserk playlist. Once Doldry was secured, all Griffith needed to do was get Prince Charlotte to agree to a marriage proposal, and he'd already laid the groundwork for that during the ball before the Battle of Doldry. But this is also where he made a crucial mistake by revealing his true feelings about his comrades. When he was talking to Princess Charlotte, she commented on how dedicated his troops were to him. The naive girl called them his friends. So Griffith corrected her and told her that while he was eternally grateful to his soldiers for their service, in the end, they were just that to him, soldiers. To Griffith, a true friend was someone who had a dream of his own, who would do anything to see that dream come to life, and who could stand beside him as an equal. Subordinates, by definition, were not friends to him, and naturally this highborn princess was impressed by this lowborn philosopher warrior's honey-laced speech. What both of them didn't know was that they had an audience. Guts and Casca were both listening to Griffith's definition of a friend, and when they both realized they didn't fit the bill, they changed. Guts realized that what he wanted was to be called Griffith's friend, not his best soldier. He resolved to acquire a dream of his own, and decided that he would leave the Band of the Falcon after the Hundred Year War campaign was over. In addition to burning down half the court, he also helped Griffith arrange a neat little self-poisoning trick, and was the first person to walk into the Victory Ball to see what all this was for. As for Casca, she finally accepted the fact that Griffith could never love her the way she wanted him to, so she started catching feelings for Guts instead, who had saved her from the Blue Whale Heavy Armor Laser Tank Spaceship Knights. She didn't realize it, but it was plain for anyone looking, Judo, to see. Following the Battle of Doldry, Griffith was technically on top of the world. 
His mercenary band, which started out as a ragtag group of thieves, was now one of the highest military orders of Midland. As the White Phoenix Knights, all of Griffith's commanders were now knighted, and he himself was a general in Midland's regular army. He'd taken out every person that could have opposed him in court, and intimidated or impressed the rest. He'd secured the romantic interest of the one person that opened his path up to royalty. And he had the general populace on his side, as he was now the savior of Midland. What with him having reclaimed Daldry for Midland and pretty much single-handedly won the Hundred Year War for them with his undefeated band of the Falcon, all he had to do was sit tight, wait for Charlotte to pop the question, and then go about his merry life as the King of Midland. But Griffith, being Griffith, he needed to control each and every aspect of his life. And that's where the downfall of the White Falcon begins. A snowy departure and the Falcon's fall how Griffith destroys his reputation and path in a single day. Once the Hundred Year War campaign was over, it was time for Guts to leave. He'd anticipated everyone would try to get him to stay, and he let everyone down gently, except Griffith. Guts had anticipated that the White Falcon would not let him go without a fight, because when he joined his service, he implicitly agreed to be a part of Griffith's grand design for the Long Haul. The White Falcon had constantly told him he was his best soldier, and him leaving would severely shake up the foundation of his army. Why would he ever willingly let go of such an asset? What Guts failed to consider was the fact that Griffith took the whole him being his property thing more seriously than any sane person would. So, when he tried to leave his grasp, it shattered Griffith's worldview. This had never happened to him before. Usually, people only left him because they died in his service or had been captured by enemy forces. Guts was the first one to try to leave his grasp of his own volition, and it just rubbed Griffith the wrong way. In the brief moments that we spend inside his head that fateful snowy morning, we get to see just how jealous and insecure of a man the White Falcon truly is. He keeps thinking to himself that Guts is overstepping his boundaries by trying to leave his grasp, when he doesn't even realize he's trying to play God out there. Griffith thinks that if he can't have Guts, then no one can, and he's ready to kill Guts if that's what it takes to make him stay. To him, this goes beyond insubordination. He feels betrayed, as though a lover had just carved his heart out and asked him for seconds. This is one of the reasons that Griffith gay for Guts memes exist. But the thing is, he never actually understood what his feelings towards Guts were. Griffith was so caught up in his own definition of a friend that he only understood he was about to lose one when it was too late, and that fact took him to the edge. What pushed him over was Guts defeating him in one damn strike, where the last time he'd made him at his mercy on at least three separate occasions. When he was sizing up Guts, Griffith acknowledged to himself that the swordsman had grown immeasurably as a fighter. Now if he was his usual calm and collected self, he'd have come up with a dirty strategy like kicking snow into his eyes or jamming his sword hand somehow so he didn't even get a swing in, because Griffith should have known a head-on attack was pure madness. Guts had recently defeated a hundred Tudor knights in a single night, and he'd also taken down the best soldier Tudor had to offer in General Bascone. Surely he was aware of how much Guts had progressed as a fighter since their first couple of fights three years ago, but as we mentioned a few moments ago, he was too caught up in his own dilemma to register any of that. Griffith thought to himself he would just feint the first attack Guts makes and then go straight for his head, but he forgets that they're in the cold and he hasn't fought a proper battle in at least the past six months. Since becoming Viscount, Griffith's work has been more administrative than militant, and he's been supervising assaults more than taking direct part in them. The Battle of Daldry was different because there, he volunteered the Band of the Falcon as the sole assaulting party to placate his dissenters within the War Council. So he had to show out, and it was easier to do it then because he had many people around him to pick up the slack. However, going one-on-one -on -one with Guts with that kind of a strategy, especially with how much he'd grown as a fighter, was a recipe for disaster, and Griffith discovered that the hard way. The feint he'd planned never came. Guts snapped his sword in half with his first blow, and then just walked off, leaving Griffith kneeling in the snow. He whispered farewell, and didn't even look back at his now former leader, because he himself was praying this didn't break the guy. Guts idolized Griffith. He owed the man a lot more than he cared to admit, and was willing to die for him. But he also knew he had to take time away from him to discover his own purpose in life. He'd been sitting with that question for far longer than his tenure as a falcon, and Griffith had inspired him to finally seek the answer to it. It's damn unfortunate that the man himself was too blinded by his own self-interests to see any of that. Guts' self-assurances that Griffith would be okay after he left were proven false that very night, when Griffith decided he had nothing to lose and made his move on Princess Charlotte. He showed up unannounced to her bedroom window, soaking because of the rain, and practically forced himself on her. Griffith was counting on the fact that Charlotte fancied him to see things through, and when he realized that she was unsure, he nudged her ahead by telling her to give herself over to the feeling. He basically committed high treason by rocking Charlotte's world the entire night, but the whole time, all he could think of was Guts. 
This isn't more evidence of Griffith's homosexual love for his departed comrade, but it's evidence of his extremely controlling nature. The White Falcon just couldn't stomach the fact that someone that was supposed to be beneath him had dared to spread its wings, so he was reclaiming that lost power by seducing Charlotte. This impulsive decision blows up in his face spectacularly, because he's caught sneaking out of the princess bedchambers after a maid sees them in the middle of the act. Griffith is thrown into a cellar in the Tower of Rebirth, and the King of Midland commissions the eradication of the Band of the Falcon, labeling them as outlaws. The entire crew is gathered under the false pretext of a training drill, and if it wasn't for Casca's presence of mind, all of them would have died that day. Griffith's torture for committing high treason is overseen by the king himself, who starts off by lamenting the destruction of a fruitful relationship, but ends up asking his jailer to inflict every torment imaginable upon the former falcon. This is because in his despair and self-pity, Griffith loses his filters and ends up calling out the king for having incestuous feelings for his daughter, and correctly so. This infuriates his majesty, and he orders the jailer to make sure Griffith stays alive for the next year, but just barely. He ends up acting on his lust for his daughter, which alienates him from Charlotte, and spends the entire year Griffith is imprisoned hunting down the rest of his comrades like a madman. The irony is, the king would end up going insane by the end of his life, and it would be because of Griffith, but we'll get to that later. For now, we want to comment on the utter self-indulgent idiocy that was Griffith's decision to sleep with Charlotte, because if he just learnt how to be patient in life, he'd have gotten that eventually anyway. Trust us when we tell you he had her in the bag when he turned a leaf into a flute, so his impatience was really only motivated by his desire to regain control over his own narrative, that narrative being a toxic self-appointment as the center of this universe. Over the course of the next year, Griffith is brutally reminded just how insignificant things like dreams can be in the face of cold, hard metal. The jailer of the Tower of Rebirth was a vile degenerate who loved inflicting pain upon his subjects, and with a subject as pretty as Griffith, he was extra careful. He flayed the falcon, scorched his exposed muscles, took away his tongue and tendons, peeled the flesh off his face, and did everything in his power to almost kill the man but keep him alive enough for the next day. And being subjected to that kind of torture is enough to break the mind of any man, no matter how strong their mental game is, let alone a fragile egoist like Griffith. After a certain point, the fallen falcon felt as though his body wasn't even real. He'd been abused to the point being conscious felt like an out-of-body experience. He was aware of the fact that his grip on sanity was loosening quickly, and it frustrated him to no end that the two things letting him hold on to it was his dream and guts. The dream bit makes sense to everyone, because Griffith has been a martyr to his dream ever since he acquired it, but the fact that Guts, the man he blames for all his misfortunes, is the one who's also keeping him sane, frustrates Griffith to no end. He thinks to himself that there are so many conflicting feelings that rise up within him when he thinks of his departed subordinate, but he couldn't even bring himself to verbalize them when he had the chance to do so. Now, all he was doing was looking for reasons to keep blaming things on Guts, and it was in this extremely sensitive and suggestive frame of mind that he made first contact with the life that awaited him on the other side. As the fallen falcon was ruminating on all the ways Guts affected his life, dodging accountability as usual, he saw a brick fall off his cell wall. Dead spirits that looked like mangled monsters emerged from within it, and they called him Prince. That word brought a spark to Griffith's eye, because being a prince was directly related to what he dreamed of becoming. When he followed the trail of spirits into the wall, he peered into a dimension that overlaps with the physical world and saw the silhouettes of his kinsmen to be. Four demonic figures, hooded in shadows, telling him he was destined to join them soon as the King of Longing. They would meet him again in that place and at that time, but until then, their message was to hold on to life as desperately as possible. When they disappeared, Griffith thought it was a hallucination, considering his current mental state, but he would soon find out that it was all real, and make a decision that alters the course of history itself, or rather, fulfills it. Rescue, Regret, and Revelations How Getting Tortured Revealed Griffith's True Face Griffith was lying down face first on the cold stone floor of this bottom cell in the Tower of Rebirth when the Griffith rescue team arrived. It had been a year since he'd been in prison there, and to say that his injuries were horrifying would be a gross understatement. Casca started crying when she saw him, and rightfully so. The man's spine was visible, for crying out loud. But even in such a terrible condition, the moment Griffith saw that it was Guts who was shaking him awake, he immediately tried to kill him. This was missed by everyone else in the room considering how shocked they were, 
but the moment Griffith sees Guts's face, he raises his arm to the swordsman's throat with the intention of choking him out. But because his wrist tendons have been severed, he'll never be able to hold anything again, much less choke out Guts. The same was true for his legs, so he couldn't walk either. We've already mentioned how his tongue was lost to the jailer's knife, who wore it like a sick trophy before Guts butchered him and took his tongue in revenge. All these factors simply meant that Griffith could no longer function as a regular human being, much less a fighter on the run from a kingdom, and he was painfully aware of that. But he also blamed Guts for all of it, because in Griffith's mind, this happened because Guts left him. So he tried to choke him out, when all Guts could do was hug him and cry. Griffith's expression softened once he saw how much Guts cared about him, but it would only soften in the moments where said expression was overt. The fallen falcon was too busy counting up everything the future Black Swordsman had stolen from him the rest of the time. As hard as it might have been for him to stomach, Guts had become even better as a swordsman in the year Griffith spent getting tortured. He saw the evidence for it firsthand when Guts cleared out the Tower of Rebirth stairway like a lawnmower cutting grass. He contributed to the rescue effort as well when he helped Pippin spot a crack in the ceiling that would save them all from becoming Bakaraka barbecue. But the rest of the time, Griffith was forced to see just how useless he was and how useful the man he hated had become to people that were technically his subordinates. This feeling was increased manifold when Griffith's current condition was exposed by the Apostle Wilde in a mad attempt to keep himself from dying. Up until that point, the band had hoped that Griffith would lead them to glory once again. Even after the rescue team returned from Wyndham, that hope remained because they didn't exactly have time to explain the entire situation to everyone. Wilde had caught up to their trail shortly after they left Wyndham, and the band was busy defending itself from his black dogs, so catching up wasn't much of a priority. Once again, Griffith had to see Guts surpass him in every measure as a warrior, as he looked on at the guy defeat an apostle pretty much all by himself. Griffith and Guts had fought an apostle together the last time they came across one, and both of them combined were no match for it. Yet now Guts was able to mortally injure one all by his lonesome, while all Griffith could do was watch on from the tree hollow he was being sheltered within. The White Falcon was seething with rage and jealousy, but it wasn't just because of Guts's progress. It was also because of his relationship with Casca. Before we get into that, let's just complete this apostle thread we've picked up on because it's important to understanding Griffith's entire life story, which is kind of the point of this video, after all. Hmm. When Guts took down Wilde initially, it felt as though that was that. He retreated to Griffith's wagon to rest. The pair got bandaged up together. Guts put Griffith's armor on him to make him feel strong again, and it felt like a real bonding moment. But then Wilde returned and pulled out Griffith from the wagon because he needed the Falcon's behelet. The dying apostle had this notion that any behelet would keep him from dying, and he recalled what Zod had told him about Griffith, so he figured he'd use the Egg of the King to stay resurrected. In order to get the stone, he exposed Griffith's condition to his men, crushing any dreams the Falcons had of soaring again, but it was an effort made in vain. Griffith had lost his behelet the first day of his imprisonment in the Tower of Rebirth, and uh, even if he did have it, that's not how behelets work. You can't just randomly use any behelet to save yourself from death, you need to be destined to use it. Wilde had no clue about that, and because he just tried to kill the next prospective member of the God Hand, he was skewered to death by none other than Zod himself. Griffith was too shocked at having been exposed like that to even react properly, but the Immortal One simply tells him that his behelet would return to him when he needed it the most, because that's how it is. He flies off into the night sky, leaving Griffith with more questions than answers, and the answers we do get regarding a shift in his personality are troubling to begin with. You remember how we said there were two things about Guts that made Griffith jealous? Well, the second thing is the fact that he stole Casca from him, even though Griffith knows damn well that she's always been his backup. To Griffith, Casca was a groupie that worshipped him no matter how bad things got. She never questioned him, and before he gives in to his fate, there's even a moment where he imagines a retired life with her in a small cottage somewhere. They have a child called Guts and a dog called Pippin, and Casca is all about serving Griffith as a dutiful wife. But this vision tells you that he clearly wanted Casca for his own selfish reasons, and that becomes clearer when he tries to force himself on her. That's right. The man who once saved her from getting raped tried to force himself on her. It's a pretty rude wake-up call for her considering just how much Casca idolized Griffith, but it makes sense when you realize that this is exactly what he did with Charlotte as well. The moment he felt as though Guts was stealing something from him, Griffith would try to regain control of his narrative by screwing someone he knew was into him. Back then, it was Charlotte. Now, it was Casca. The difference is, his history with Casca is far more extensive than his history with Charlotte, and him doing that to her, especially in this state, really opened her eyes to his true nature. Casca was shocked, and she couldn't bring herself to tell Guts what had happened to her. She rejected Griffith's advances, of course, but she also rejected Guts's proposal to travel with him once this was over because she felt as though Griffith still needed her. Even though he'd just tried to do to her what he once saved her from, 
Her embedded sense of loyalty to him ran deeper than her cultivated love for Guts, so she withheld that information from him in the hopes that the topic would soon change. How tragic it is, then, that her wish was granted in the form of the worst event in Berserk and her personal history, the Eclipse. Accepting his true nature and a prophetic reincarnation, the Eclipse and the birth of Femto. Considering his extremely logical and self-justifying ways, you'd think that Griffith wouldn't be the type to believe in things like fate and destiny. But he bought his behelot from a fortune teller when he was still a kid, and he's constantly expressed his desire to understand his own place in the world. Going back to that opening dialogue, before asking those questions, Griffith stated that he felt as though the world was at the mercy of some great tide, and he was aware of the fact that certain keys made that tide shift. What he didn't know was that he was soon going to become one of those keys himself and the sheer poetry of him wearing the behelot, which is a key to the astral world while well, well, thinking all this is just literary ASMR for our brain. But you can really see his moral ambiguity even when it comes to religious topics in the aftermath of his and Gus's fight with Zod. The White Falcon put on a brave performance, managing to slice off one of Zod's arms and nearly gets Guts to safety, but the key word there is nearly. Griffith gets knocked out by one poor swipe from the Immortal One, and from this point forward, his memory is as good as useless. The rest of the band was too busy panicking on the sidelines when they saw their heroic boss get punked out like a rubber chicken. So Guts was the only one who truly understood why he, Griffith, and the rest of the Falcons were left alive that day. It was because of Griffith's behelot. Zod took one look at that thing and backed off as if he'd seen a ghost. But clearly this was Casper, or someone like that, because he then broke into a maniacal laugh and warned Guts that an inescapable death would visit him once Griffith's ambition collapses, provided the Falcon thinks of him as a friend. It's so frustrating to think that everything that happens after the Battle of Daldry could have been avoided if Guts and Griffith had just had an honest conversation about their dynamic. But alas, men will be men. Neither man verbalizes what the other means to them when it matters the most, and by the time they start expressing, <laughs> it's too late. There was a moment after the Zod fight where they could have gotten things straight. When Guts asked Griffith why he rushed into the fortress to save his life when he was just a lowly soldier, Griffith replied by asking him if he needed a reason to save Guts' life. If only the swordsman had been a little pushy about what the Falcon meant by that, clarity would have benefited both of them. But that isn't why we bring up the Zod fight. The reason for that is Griffith's reaction to discovering the existence of things like monsters and apostles. He tells Guts that Zod being active was proof that a higher power was at work somewhere, and that things like gods did exist. When Guts corrected him by asking if he meant devils, Griffith replied by rhetorically stating that they were one and the same. This too was left precariously unpacked by the bunch, because what this tells us is that to Griffith, what mattered more was the power associated with divinity, not the moral purpose. He wasn't helpless by any means, but he disliked relying on others for the realization of his dream. If Griffith had had Zod's strength, he wouldn't have needed the Band of the Falcon at all. Or even if he did, he wouldn't have treated them the way he had up until then with that kind of power. This obsession with power becomes even more intense once Griffith experiences true powerlessness, and that's why the Zod fight is relevant to this section of the video. Once he loses mobility, Griffith is forced to watch the man he holds responsible for his condition show off his own strength on multiple occasions. That feeling of frustration and helplessness is increased exponentially when Griffith is exposed by Wilde and forced to watch his men come to terms with his status as an invalid. And it's concretized once Casca rejects him, which brings Griffith back to the other thing that was keeping his sanity hanging by a thread, his dream. As he wallows in self-pity over his pathetic fall from grace, Griffith sees a vision of his childhood self, urging him to follow because playtime wasn't over yet. Empowered by this hallucination, Griffith somehow manages to steal the wagon he was resting in, steer it by holding the reins with his teeth, and chase down his crazy vision. As he does so, he comes upon a lake which resides on the western border of Midland. Griffith wasn't paying any particular attention to where his former self was taking him. He was going along for the ride. But maybe he should have been, because along the way his wagon hit a rock and he went flying off the driver's seat. That vision about a possible life with Casca we mentioned a few moments ago, it was a fleeting experience Griffith had as he flew through the air. Upon landing on the lake's shallow shores, he snapped back to reality and realized that what he truly desired was either escape or elevation. Griffith was already pretty frail from the year-long torture he'd endured in the Tower of Rebirth. His lean, toned body became a mummified husk of itself, and the impact of his crash landing was such that it broke his sword arm. Perhaps he was hoping to find some miracle cure for his tendons, because up until then, Griffith hadn't exactly reacted to not being able to move his wrist anymore. But seeing the bone jut out of his elbow definitely let him know that he would no longer be able to fight. Griffith starts laughing and crying like a maniac at this prospect, and in that moment of despair, he finds a jagged piece of wood sticking out of the lake. 
He positions himself in such a way that the wood could go through his throat if he just applied enough pressure, but his frail body was unable to achieve even a minor feat like this. So it makes sense that Griffith broke down crying, feeling utterly helpless and filled with despair at his powerlessness. And it's at this moment that destiny, desire and despair all collide to give Griffith what he truly wanted, the strength to make his dream a reality. As he bawled his eyes out at not even being able to kill himself, Griffith noticed that somehow his behelot had returned to him. As he raised it with his good hand, Zod's words rang in his ears. It had returned to him when he needed it most. As he held it up, it was now Wilde who urged him to see it and summon their guardian angels. Griffith didn't know what their words meant quite yet, but he was sure that he needed to use the behelot to escape his current destiny. The fortune teller's words didn't come up in his mind when he saw the thing, but they'd become relevant soon enough. Just as apostles surrounded him, Griffith was happened upon by Guts, who had followed him ever since he took off unexpectedly. The fallen falcon panicked at the sight of the swordsman to the extent he couldn't even complete his own thoughts. He screamed at Guts to stay away from him, but the words didn't come out because his tongue wasn't there to help him elicit them. He thought to himself that if Guts came near him or touched him, he would, and then his thoughts trailed off. But we can tell you exactly what he was thinking. If Guts touched him again, he'd never be able to make up his mind to obtain the power that he needed. Griffith was acutely aware of the effect Guts had on him whenever he was around the guy. He didn't want to give in to the comfort of friends and family again. In the fallen falcon's mind, he couldn't afford it. Ironically enough, it was the moment in which he thought he would become completely powerless that he unlocked his true destiny. When Guts caught up with Griffith, the latter subconsciously activated his crimson behelot because he desired the power to make everything flow according to his will and this ended up summoning the God Hand. Griffith had seen their silhouettes before in that semi-fever dream he had back in the Tower of Rebirth. They'd called him a prince back then, and promised him that his day was coming. Now that it was here, Griffith listened to every word uttered by his future kinsman with rapt attention. He gazed at Void's fleshless dome with tears of blood that resembled his crying behelot as the Archangel welcomed everyone to the nocturnal feast. He addressed the apostles as the lambs of the unholy god born of man, and charged them with enjoying this sacred festival to the fullest. He then turned his attention toward Griffith, and addressed him as the child consecrated by causality that was chosen to become their kinsman. When he called him the blessed king of longing, Griffith put two and two together, and started rushing toward the god hand because he knew that these people would give him the power he needed. He was held back by Guts, who yelled defiance in the god hand's face. The swordsman spit venom at them, ridiculing the idea that Griffith was to become a demon when he didn't even have a tail, and he knew this because he'd seen him naked. His passionate defense of his former leader's personality gave Griffith pause, and what the God Hand said next about the process of acquiring that power made him seem hesitant. The other three members of the demonic quadrangle were marveling at Guts's friendship with Griffith, because they knew that the stronger the emotions, the greater the quality of sacrifice. And that's exactly what the Falcon was going to have to do in order to obtain the power for which he summoned the God Hand, sacrifice his friends. This fact seemed to shock Griffith, because his eyes went blank and his mouth became lopsided when he heard that. Every subsequent word uttered by the God Hand confirmed for him something he'd only suspected before, that his destiny was at the mercy of the great tide of fate, or rather causality, as Berserk likes to call it. Ubik tells Griffith his possession of the Crimson Behelet was proof he was meant to join the God Hand, but it would be more accurate to say that because Griffith possessed the qualities to become a demon king, the Behelet found its way to him. This clearly unnerved Griffith, as did the fact that everyone gathered around him was a monster known as an apostle that had used a Behelet to gain their proper forms, just like he was doing at that moment. Him choosing to activate the Behelet proved that he belonged with the God Hand, but what would truly seal the deal with regards to his ascension would be the sacrifice of all of his comrades. As if to show him what awaited him on the other side, all the apostles gathered for the feast assumed their released forms, making the entire band of the Falcon experience the same emotion, despair. Guts chimes in again after seeing this and lays into the God Hand for thinking that they were gonna get away with taking their lives and turning their leader into one of these monsters. But this is where a crucial correction is made to his assumptions. The God Hand wasn't going to force anything onto anyone. The real reason behind the band of the Falcon ending up on the altar would be Griffith's will, not theirs. This makes the fallen Falcon spiral even further which could be why he didn't exactly try to resist being raised up to meet the God Hand on a more up-close and personal basis. Guts tried to hold on to him, but he realized Griffith's arm would be ripped off if he did that, so he reluctantly let go. This was his biggest mistake, because if he'd stayed with Griffith, he could have at least tried talking him out of what he was about to do. This is going to be an entirely different video, because there's so much to address on this front, but the God Hand doesn't quite make people accept their true natures so much as they nudge them toward embracing evil. This is very evident in the way they play Griffith's memories back to him, because they take it all back to his original dream. 
When Griffith is separated from Guts, he comes face to face with the God Hand for the first time, and Void asks him if he was afraid of them. The truth is, Griffith was scared of them, because he didn't quite understand what was going on. He didn't quite understand what he himself was feeling, and now, more than ever, he needed clarity. He got that clarity in the form of a guided tour down memory lane, courtesy of Ubik and Conrad. Ubik used his consciousness projection technique to use a fragment of Griffith's memories and reveal his true nature to him. In this memory, Griffith was his childhood self once again, and he was running across the cobblestone streets of his childhood city. He was looking for his friends because they'd agreed to go and see the castle that day, but he couldn't find them. He asks an old woman spinning a thread on a street corner whether she'd seen them, and she points him in their direction, while also mentioning that they were waiting for him. Griffith follows the road, but all he sees is darkness, until he looks down and realizes the path was composed of hundreds of corpses. He freaks out and falls face first into them, his mind unable to cope with the overwhelming nature of it all. The old woman shows up and he asks her why she sent him here, knowing his friends were dead, when she gives him the harshest reality check of all time. He knew it as well. Griffith had known that his path was a bloody one all this time, yet now, when he saw the consequences of it gathered in one place, he rejected it. That child we mentioned a few minutes ago, the one Casca thought made Griffith feel guilty about his cause, he returned in this dream and asked Griffith to take him to the castle, make him one of his knights. The corpses stood up one by one and begged him to fight underneath his banner, but he screamed at them that he couldn't take them because they were all dead. The old woman chastised Griffith for his naivety because wasn't he the one who brought them this far? Griffith tried to dodge accountability by saying he never forced anyone to join him, the same logic he'd given to Casca all those years ago, but this time it was thrown back in his face, and rightfully so. The old woman reminded Griffith that ignorance was bliss, but not something he could afford if he truly wanted to achieve his dream. He'd always known how many corpses it would take to make it a reality, and the mounds created by his dead soldiers. Those deaths were on him as well. She showed him that even after causing so much death, Griffith was only halfway to acquiring that thing. When he hesitated and showed signs of fear once again, resting his destiny, the woman, which was actually Ubik and Conrad in cosplay, dropped the ultimate bomb on him. She told him that if he repented and turned back now, he'd end up in the dirt just like his comrades, and everything would have been meaningless. If he couldn't handle the consequences of his actions, why couldn't he just be content with gazing at the castle? Griffith tried to deflect once again, but this time when the lady said that he should have known what kind of place this was, he accepted her logic. The truth is, Griffith had always known his dream was going to come at the cost of other people's lives. He was only regretting it now because he was seeing its cumulative effects in front of his eyes, and it's a lot to take in for a man that essentially never grew up. So, once he's reminded of that fact, it becomes much easier for him to accept every other truth the God Hand opens his eyes up to. He does wonder for a moment if what he's just experienced was an illusion, but the God Hand makes it clear to him that this was his subconscious reality. He felt responsible for his comrades because they'd given him everything he'd asked of them, and then some. At this crucial juncture, he felt conflicted. He'd just been made aware of the grave ill effects of his childish dream, and he now wanted to prevent that fate for the ones gathered below his rebirth altar. And for their part, the God Hand accepted his hesitancy. They told him the Falcons should be glad for their sacrifice, because they would be able to finally meaningfully contribute to his dream, or otherwise he could resign himself to burying everything in the ruin of his dreams. That hits Griffith where it hurts, and Void capitalizes on that vulnerability by telling him that even if now that castle from his childhood dazzled in his eyes, then he should embrace his true self, pile up the corpses, and make his way to it with everything he needed at his disposal. All he needed to do was chant the words, I sacrifice in his heart, and he'd be granted raven black wings upon which he would soar higher than any before him. This pitch sold Griffith on accepting these demonic entities' deal, and he chanted the words just as Guts made summit at his altar. When the Hand of God enclosed Griffith within a cocoon to prepare his body for its rebirth, Guts knelt in front of it, trying to cut it open at first, but eventually accepting that this was what Griffith wanted. He leapt off to take out his anger on the apostles beneath him instead, and he was the only man lucky enough to survive, because the rest of the Falcons died gruesome deaths one after the other. In the meantime, Griffith's soul sunk deeper and deeper into the abyss, as he thought back on what he'd just done. At one point, after enough of them had been devoured by apostles, his comrades' dead souls pierced through his body. But to his surprise, Griffith doesn't feel anything. By that, he means he feels no emotion, no guilt, no regret, no rage, nothing. He's indifferent and sinking deeper into the depths of the astral world when he encounters a shimmering pool of light. Upon taking a closer look at it, he sees that the droplets coming off of this pool are actually behelots, and he goes to ask why that was the case out loud to himself when a voice answers back. It tells him that these were splashes, 
droplets primed with ideas that are spilled over from the sea into eternity. Griffith crosses that shimmering lake and arrives in the bowels of the abyss where he meets God, a massive heart-shaped entity with thousands of eyes covering it and a double helix stretching downward from its base into the unending abyss. This God was the idea of evil. Their conversation makes Griffith realize that everything he thought he'd done independently was actually done as part of the idea's machinations. This ugly, beating lump of flesh was created by humans because they desired reasons to justify their suffering, and over time, it became the very thing that ruled human destiny. The idea created the appropriate lineage and historical context for Griffith's birth and facilitated every encounter he had in life because it was decided a long time ago that he would end up here. We find out after the eclipse that this decision was a reference to the prophecy of the Falcon, which matched the timeline of events that unfolded during Griffith's eclipse to a T. When the fallen Falcon asks the idea what it wants from him, expressing willful subordination for the first time in his life, he's told to do as he wishes. The dialogue that follows is rather wordy, but it explains what happened to Griffith after he chanted the words necessary for the invocation of doom. While his physical body was transforming within a cocoon atop the God Hand altar, his astral body, aka his soul, had descended into the abyss. On its way, it absorbed the life forces of all the falcons that the apostles devoured during the eclipse, which formed the base of his new power as a God Hand. Once he understood the idea of evil's reason for existing and verified his own existence through it, Griffith was told to do as he willed, because he was now a part of the human subconscious. The astral world is as good as the subconscious mind, so when Griffith gave up his body, he became a part of everyone's minds. The idea encouraged Griffith to take the form he felt was most appropriate for his task, and Griffith, being the falcon, chose wings. He harnessed the power of the dead soul swirling within the abyss as one of their new masters and assumed the final stage of the form his physical body was taking in its cocoon. With dead falcons forming his power base and other deceased spirits creating his new body, Griffith's transformation into a god hand was now complete. His human heart was now frozen, the last tear he shed crystallized in a far-off dimension that couldn't be understood by space or time. He was no longer a mortal being with a body of flesh. He was a profound metaphysical entity with command over legions upon legions of apostle monsters. Griffith was reborn as the God Hand member Femto, and this is exactly what the prophecy of the Falcon warned against. When the sun dies five times, a red lake will appear west of a city with a name both old and new. It's a sign that the fifth angel will alight. He is the Falcon of Darkness, the king of the blind white sheep and master of the sinful black sheep. His birth will bring with it an age of darkness, and Femto proves the truth of these words with his first act as a virgin god and member. One of the last things that Griffith consciously did as a human being was trying to force himself on Casca. He did it at a moment he felt utterly powerless, and he wanted to re-establish his dominance over Guts. Now that he had the power to do virtually anything he desired, he got to work on doing just that by giving us the most harrowing three chapters of Berserk. Griffith doesn't just assault Casca, he humiliates her, uses her like a toy, and makes Guts watch all the while. Because he's now a member of the God Hand, he's a literal god to the Apostles. When Femto was born, every Apostle in the Eclipse Interstice fell silent and stopped doing whatever they were doing to attend to the birth of their new king. One of Femto's natural powers as a God Hand member is control over every Apostle in existence, and he uses this power to tie down Guts as he finishes up with Casca. The struggle Guts puts up to reach Griffith sees him lose an arm and an eye, and he doesn't even come close to rescuing Casca from his clutches. In the end, he's forced to listen to her asking him to close his eyes, because even as she was getting violated by the man she once worshipped as her god, Casca didn't want Guts to suffer further. And that's another thing we want you guys to let sink into your psyches. Griffith just up and abused one of the people he saved from that very act a long time ago just as a power move. Now that the gloves were off, Femto was showing the world what he'd always been capable of doing, but lacked the power to do. When he was finished establishing his dominance, he tossed Casca aside like a toy he'd grown bored with, which shows you the level of detachment he was operating on. Before he could do anything else, the enigma known as the Skull Knight broke into the Eclipse site and Femto was forced to figure out his godly powers on the fly. He realized that he had some sort of spatial or gravitational control ability, because when he tried to stop Skull Knight from rescuing Guts and Casca, he ended up turning a few apostles into mulch. But this could just be chalked up to him having training wheels on. When it came to things like magic, Femto was a literal newborn, so him not being able to stop Skull Knight didn't matter much. What mattered was the fact that with him, the cycle was complete, and the God Hand could now start working on bringing about that age of darkness that the Holy See's prophecy of the Falcon foretells. And we want you to keep the source for that prophecy in mind, because it'll be crucial to understanding Griffith's new plan to take over the world.
the incarnation invitation, what Griffith does for two years as a God Hand member, and how he returns to Earth. Following the eclipse, there wasn't much Griffith could do to overtly affect the physical world because he was now a purely astral entity. But being on top of the food chain in his territory, he knew a lot more about the way the world was going to work than anyone else, and that showed in the two years between his ascension and reunion with Guts. While Guts was busy wiping apostles off the face of the earth and tracking down the God Hand as the Black Swordsman, Femto was busy understanding his new powers and how to properly control them. He also needed to get a proper feel for his near prescient translation of the causal current as a brand new God Hand member. But because time flows differently in different layers of the astral world when compared to the physical world, it didn't take him a lot of time to get up to speed on things. And within that two year time frame, he became a seamless part of the God Hand's malevolent song and dance routine whilst also having improved his control over his special powers exponentially. When Skull Knight broke into the Eclipse, Griffith couldn't even target him properly. He had to extend his arm and physically activate his technique by closing his palm into a fist. After two years of training, he could activate his ability by sight, and he proved this when he punked guts upon their reunion. Now that the God Hand set was complete, the five Guardian Angels of Desire could get to work on bringing the Age of Darkness to the physical world. They couldn't have done so before Griffith joined their ranks because, as we told you guys in the last section, the Prophecy of the Falcon singled him out as the Harbinger of Doom. Now that he was with them, they could move on to the next stages of their master plan, which included two crucial steps. One, convince an Apostle to reincarnate twice, and two, incarnate Femto's astral body back into the physical world. The first stage is how Guts and Femto meet again. We'll explain the why later, so let's get into the how. After a grueling battle with the Slug Count, which saw him nearly get pummeled to death on more than one occasion, Guts finally managed to track down the God Hand when the Count reactivated his Behelet. This is the only time this has happened in the series, and if you want to learn more about its significance, we suggest you check out our video on the Slug Count's anatomy. But once Guts saw where he was and who he was facing, his body went into instant rage mode. Despite his broken fingers and ribs and a bajillion other injuries, he charged headfirst at the former Griffith and was stopped dead in his tracks by the sheer pain that God Hand's presence fled up in his brand of sacrifice. Femto was treating Guts like an inconsequential bug at this point. He greeted the Black Swordsman by commenting that he was still squirming about in his miserable existence, and when he recovered from the pain of his brand, which would have made anyone else pass out a long time ago, Femto cut off Guts' attempted strike by flinging him into a wall. He didn't even raise a finger to make it happen this time either. A glance was all it took. Femto's role in the God Hand's negotiations was to muscle the target into accepting the deal. He focused on the sacrifice itself and used intimidation to try and get the best results. Femto threatened the Count into reincarnating twice, given that every second he spent otherwise drew his soul closer to that endless vortex. But on this particular occasion, a father's love won over an apostle's greed for reincarnation, and so Femto's intimidation tactics failed. We're sure if it was someone more desperate, they'd be stumbling all over themselves trying to make the sacrifice happen ASAP. The final indicator of his growth as a God Hand member came when Femto effortlessly tanked a goddamn cannon shot. Guts' hidden arm cannon has come in clutch for him on many occasions. There have been times when it made the difference between death and victory for him, and his arm cannon was even effective against the corundum skinned Apostle Grunbeld and the physical manifestation of the God Hand Slan. But Femto is cut from a different cloth, as he has the power to make space itself move according to his will. He can't open up portals like Void, but he sure as hell can manipulate the space in and around him to both attack and defend. When Guts fires a cannonball in his direction, Femto erects an invisible wall that completely negates the impact of the shot. He's mastered his abilities as a God Hand member, which means that they're ready to commence work on Phase 2, initiating the Incarnation Ceremony. The God Hand, though all-powerful within the Astral Domain, have limited influence over the physical world. They're metaphysical beings, large collections of abstract thoughts and feelings that can't just wave a hand and make a mountain disappear. They need agents in the physical world that can carry out their will for them, which is why apostles are birthed. They can influence the thoughts and feelings of humanity on a collective level by invading their subconscious minds. But they themselves can't physically manifest into the material world and enact their wills with their own hands, because to do that, they need a body of flesh. And that's where Femto becomes the centerpiece of the God Hand's mysterious agenda, because he's the one chosen by causality to receive that body of flesh. The Holy See's Prophecy of the Falcon is a warning about Griffith's eclipse, but it's also a warning about Femto's incarnation into the physical world. He is the master of the sinful black sheep and the king of the blind white sheep. The former is a reference to apostles, who are creatures created through sin to propagate sin. The latter is a reference to humans, who are often blinded by things like dogma and doctrine into believing whatever religious figure can bring them salvation. After Griffith's eclipse, 
The state of the world was in rapid decline, because many kingdoms were entering a period of chaos and destruction. Midland's army was spread thin on a wild goose chase because their mad king wouldn't rest until he recaptured Griffith. His ignorance of his kingdom security had allowed the ruthless and barbaric Kushan to invade Midland and treat its defenses and people with impunity. What was once a strong nation held together by a historic victory in the Hundred Years' War was now infected with the plague, teeming with heretics on every corner and burdened with the feeling of utter soul-crushing hopelessness. All of these things weren't exactly the king's fault, because the lead-up to the incarnation ceremony showed us just how the God Hand influenced the physical world as metaphysical beings. The plague we just mentioned? It was engineered by Conrad, the God Hand most associated with pestilence, who brought his black rats to the city squares and back alleys of every major city in Midland. Those heretics that were popping up on every street corner? Most of them worship a salacious flame goddess, who encourages her followers to shed their human inhibitions and give themselves over to desire entirely. Needless to say, that goddess is none other than Slan, the embodiment of lust in the current iteration of the God Hand. When things get this bad, the elites worry about petty things like power sharing, but the common folk ask for only one thing, to be saved from their plights. And this is where the true metaphysical power of the God Hand can be observed, because they use their influence over the human mind to start convincing people that their savior was none other than Griffith. Shortly before his ascension, Griffith was known as the savior of Midland, and rightfully so. The Hundred Year War had stretched on for a hundred years because all of Midland's previous military leaders were not as competent as Griffith was. He ended a seemingly never-ending war by being involved in it for a fraction of the time that it had been going on for, and that kind of a historic feat isn't forgotten by common folks easily. Not to mention, the king never even explained why he was chasing down Griffith to anyone in his court, including his most trusted advisors, and many in Midland thought the Falcon was dead. They were correct, of course, in more ways than one, because the man whose return they were praying for was no man at all, but a demon clad in the purest white feathers of a falcon. Chapters 126 to 128 of Berserk are titled Revelations, because this is the God Hand's plan, to convince people that their savior was coming and that that savior would be none other than Griffith. But why was this necessary? Well, besides the obvious propaganda, they needed to gather up a lot of people at a particular astrally charged location, that location being the Tower of Conviction, which was in the holy city of St. Albion. The Tower of Conviction has a lot of spiritual significance in the world of Berserk. It was one of two major landmarks in the ancient city of Supreme King Geyseric. It was the site of Void's capture and torture as a human being, allegedly. And after the rise of the Holy See, it had become a place of brutal religious indoctrination, which often rejected giving back to the people because of the notoriously high standards of that faith. As a consequence, the land surrounding the Tower of Conviction was filled with layers upon layers of buried souls that were denied the justice of contentment in death. These souls would usually remain inactive, but because the God Hand needed some shit to go down right here, they arranged events in such a fashion that the two people who could rile up those spirits would arrive in St. Albion back to back. The first one to arrive was Casca, and Guts came in close at her heels because he just decided to do better as a partner and human being. But the branded pair collecting in one spot would have been enough trouble by itself. When it was an astrally charged location like St. Albion, it became a crisis, because their presence is what triggered the incarnation ceremony. The ceremony itself was supposed to mirror the eclipse, except on a much larger and tangible scale. Where the eclipse took place within the astral world, the incarnation ceremony took place in the physical world and traced certain phenomena from that domain that could not be changed by the hand of man. For Griffith to become a God Hand member, he had to sacrifice nearly 500 people, whose flesh, blood and soul then went into his power of evil charged being. For that being to come into the physical world, it would require the flesh, blood and soul of thousands of human beings and dead spirits, as well as a vessel to contain it, whilst also incubating Femto's new form. That vessel was the egg of the perfect world, who manipulated events in St. Albion in such a way that the spirit saturation of that place hit critical mass within a week. Once he'd done that, he climbed the tower, planted his roots into the ceiling, and waited for the blood to come flowing into his body. It took the entire night for the incarnation ceremony to run through its course, and during that time, the God Hand's machinations turned an entire refugee slum into a desolate wasteland. Only a handful of people survived where there had been thousands before, and when day broke, he finally arrived. With the blood, body and soul of all the people the blood flow of the dead consumed during the incarnation ceremony, Femto finally manifested into the physical world with a body of flesh, and he took on his previous human form of Griffith to take maximum advantage of the seeds he and his kinsmen had planted. Because a God Hand member is a profoundly spiritual entity, 
Their birth into the physical domain would feel like a divine occurrence to anyone who was there to witness it. So, it was for the survivors of the incarnation ceremony, which included guts as well, albeit it was for a very brief moment. The dream of Griffith's arrival wasn't just one sent out to human beings, it was also sent out to the man that started it all for him, Nosferatu Zod. Zod was the first apostle Griffith had ever met, and their fight is what opened his eyes to a whole new world of power. Once he ascended, he must have realized how Zod helped facilitate his rise to power, and having already tasted the Immortal One's strength, Griffith knew he could ask for no better right-hand man. So, when the humans were witnessing the dream of a soaring falcon whose wings would take them to salvation, Zod was being shown a menacing falcon that had come to give him his heart's desire, a fight with the absolute strongest being. God hands are more powerful than apostles as a general rule of thumb, and when Griffith challenged Zod in his metaphysical falcon form, the Immortal One wasn't thinking much about the hierarchy of things. He just wanted a fight with the strongest, so he assumed his released form and tried attacking Griffith. When the horn the falcon sliced off in his subconscious fell at his feet in the physical world, Zod knew he'd found the man he was looking for, and gladly submitted to Femto's direction of showing up at the Tower of Conviction upon his rebirth. The Immortal One was the first to swear fealty to his old master in his new form, and Femto departed the side of his rebirth standing on the palm of his brand new ride. Guts was livid at the fact that he felt even a second of reverence for Griffith and wanted to kill both him and Zod before either escaped, but he had bigger things to attend to at the moment. The Kushan invaders of Midland had surrounded him and the remaining survivors of the incarnation ceremony, and he needs to get Casca to safety quickly. He managed to escape with her and make it to Godot's cave, where he unexpectedly got the chance to do what he couldn't at the Tower of Conviction, because for his first act as a newly born god on Earth, Griffith chose to confirm his own convictions. When he became a demon king, the idea of evil told him that he had already shed the last tear he was ever going to shed as a human being. His suffering, which was so profound that it tore him apart both mentally and emotionally, had frozen his heart so as to shield it from unwanted emotion. The idea told Griffith that his will was going to end up shaping the future destiny of mankind, now that their existences were mutually exclusive. So, the first thing Griffith wanted to do after returning to the physical world was to confirm whether any of his human weaknesses had come back with him. Standing atop the Hill of Swords, Looking at the graves of the people he sacrificed for his selfish needs, staring at the remnants of his band in Rickett and Guts, Griffith felt nothing. The idea had kept its end of the bargain, and stripped him of the feelings that led him astray in his previous life. He declared that he was finally free of his human limitations, announcing his intention to make his dream a reality with his newfound powers. And in order to do that, Griffith was going to co-opt the prophecy that he and his kinsmen had sent out in preparation for his arrival. The False Saviour and the Demonic War Griffith vs. Ganishka and the birth of the New World The prophecy of the Falcon describes a harbinger of doom, incarnating on Earth and leading it into an age of darkness with his flock of white and black sheep. This prophecy is recorded in one of the oldest scriptures of the Holy See, and in the aftermath of the eclipse, the Sea's Miracle Recognition Department dispatched a unit to confirm whether it was going to take place or not. When the Holy Iron Chain Knights came across the blood-red lake that was foretold to appear when the sun died a fifth time, the Sea knew that something evil was afoot and got to work on finding the person who would be responsible for it and nipping the problem in the bud. They made a mistake in thinking that Guts was the Falcon of Darkness, because everywhere the Black Swordsman went, strange creatures and certain death followed closely on his heels. If they'd managed to question him properly after they captured him, perhaps they'd have realized that both the Sea and Guts were looking for the same person, Griffith. But because the latter is a stubborn lug used to getting tortured, and the former a bureaucratic order more than an actual fighting force, that conversation never ends up happening. However, because the God Hand is near prescient and generally aware of everything that's happening in the world at the moment, they must have picked up on the fact that their boy might end up getting exposed if he's incarnated without a proper context. So, they created that context with the prophetic dreams of the Falcon of Light. They positioned him as the saviour of mankind and apostle kind alike, a messiah that would take away the plights of all those who chose to follow him. Because Griffith was known as the White Falcon in his mortal life, the mortals associated this bright visage of a falcon in flight that they saw in their dreams with him, and this gave him the perfect stage to take over the world as its false saviour. Griffith had a lot of credibility with the higher nobility of Midland thanks to his contributions to the Hundred Year War. He already had a relationship with the princess, who was waiting for him to come rescue her from her own despair any day now. He had an immortal right-hand man in Zod, and he himself was practically untouchable now as a god hand, inhabiting a body of flesh. The Kingdom of Midland had nearly collapsed by the time he made his move, because the Kushan invasion was in full throttle. They had occupied the capital city of Wyndham, and were expanding further west, into territory that went beyond Midland. 
They had plans to unite the entire continent of man under Ganeshka's bloody banners, and the Kushan war machine was unstoppable, what with its war slaves, demonic soldiers, and magical beasts. All of these things were unfolding in such a way that it felt as though Griffith was writing his own story. And that's not an inaccurate summation of things, considering his immense power. Being a god hand on earth made Griffith absolute, so he made a plan to ensure he was seen as the absolute by his future subjects as well. Religion and politics have always been closely associated with one another, whether it's berserk or real life. Politically speaking, Griffith had a very solid foundation for a triumphant return, and that's pretty much what ends up happening once people like LeBan and Owen realize that he's still alive. But it's the religious context that Griffith layers upon his return that gives him the proper stage to finally bring his dream to life. The dreams of the Falcon of Light only subliminally hinted at Griffith being said Falcon. The people who knew of him immediately associated him with it, but those that didn't needed that extra push. Griffith decided to give them that push by having the highest authority of the Holy See, the Pontiff himself, verify his status as the Falcon of Light. The Pontiff was at death's door and about to kick the bucket when he was rejuvenated with life upon witnessing the Falcon's dream. The old man that couldn't even get out of bed a moment ago was now attending his visitors from afar because he knew they'd come to take him to the Saviour. Upon seeing Griffith, the Pontiff fell on his knees and performed prostration in his direction, which shocked everyone in attendance. Seeing the equivalent of the Pope bowing down to a man they didn't even want to see lead them put the good nobles of Ritanis and other sea territories in a mood sourer than they'd been in the night before, because this basically meant they had no choice but to accept Griffith as their leader. And even if they had tried to resist it, the Falcon had already set things up in such a way that they would need his help to win against the Kushan. The first move Griffith made towards securing his kingdom was to liberate the city of Shet. The Kushan had turned the place into a wasteland, culling the men and rounding up the women to be carried off as sex slaves, or worse, mothers for Dakas. As soon as Griffith shows up, the Kushan try to attack him, but all of their arrows miss him because he uses his special powers to change their trajectory. He then flies with his horse in the direction of the general, killing him instantly. The rest of the soldiers are cleared up by the apostles that show up to serve their master, and this is where the base of Griffith's new army is created. His first proper recruits are a bunch of base-level apostles, and a few elites whom he appoints as his new captains, Grunbeld, Locus, Irvine, and Raxus. Because Griffith was planning to use these apostles as his main fighting force, he calls them his war demons and assigns each one of them a unit to oversee. Grunbeld gets all the giants that tower well over 10 feet in the regular states. Irvine gets the archer's unit, being a master archer himself. Locus is given charge of the lancer unit, as he was a legendary jouster that went undefeated in his human life. And Raxus leads the search and destroy unit, because being a former Bakiraka assassin with a taste for toying with his victims made him the perfect leader for a clean-up unit. As Zod was the only one out of Griffith's elites that could fly, he's put in charge of the aerial unit, and these five groups form the core of Griffith's War Demons Corps. On top of that, he makes several human additions to his army that bolster his reputation with the bulk of his prospective subjects. The Apostles were always going to fall in line in Griffith's presence. He was their natural master, so they instinctively revered him and bowed down to him whenever he was close to them. Sure, they could get out of hand at some point, but that's why contingencies exist, and Griffith had one in mind for his ravenous new talons and beaks. But the humans were the ones he truly needed to sell on his divine right to rule over them, so he started doing just that by showing them miracles. When Griffith liberated Shet, he was joined by a young girl called Sonya, and this girl would become one of his most critical allies in the campaign to come. This is because Sonya is completely enamored by Griffith's very being, and she possesses astral powers that he needs to fight his war as efficiently as possible. Griffith knows Sonya can see things like the flow of Odd on a battlefield and the many paths of the astral world. She has visions and spouts off prophecies randomly that tend to come true more often than not. In one word, she was his oracle, and to keep her by his side, Griffith indulged her obsession with him whilst maintaining just enough distance to keep her craving his company. After Sonya, the next notable human to join Griffith's service was a young lordling called Mule Wolfflame, and it's through Mule that we get to see these miracles that convinced humanity Griffith was their saviour. Lord Wolfflame was the last member of a small but proud noble family that lived on the edge of Midland's borders. They were so low in the pecking order that their family wasn't even allowed to enter the royal court. But House Wolfflame was proud and dutiful, and that's how Mule was introduced as well. He'd lost his seat and family to the Kushan bastards, but instead of retreating and coming back with a plan, he wanted to rally one last time and die protecting his subjects. His bravery was evident, but so was his foolishness. Luckily, he doesn't have to do either, because just as Mule squares up to the Kushan, they're swept over by Griffith's reborn band of the Falcon. This name wasn't chosen by him, 
The people that were following his war camp were mostly refugees from Midland, and they recalled his exploits as their saviour the last time around, so they named his new group out of a sense of nostalgia. Mule is shocked to see Griffith's arrow formation work out so seamlessly, and he's unnerved when Sonya telepathically saves him from an arrow ambush, and then Griffith flies to the Kushan general and takes off his head. Mule's confusions only increase when he walks around the Falcon's camp, because there he realizes that this man had added their enemies to his ranks. Griffith had inducted Kushan soldiers into the band of the Falcon, and this was highly offensive to Mule, because he'd just seen Kushan warriors abuse his childhood home. But he was informed that these guys were actually war slaves, and they'd only joined the band officially once they'd proven their worth on the battlefield at least three times. Mule cannot shake off the feeling that something was off about all of this, and that feeling was only expounded the deeper he ventured into the Falcon's camp. Mule came across legendary names like Locus and Grunbeld, and while he was impressed that Griffith had added such names to his ranks, he also wondered how in the hell were these guys alive? As far as he knew, Locus was a solo knight who was on an eternal peregrination. He'd never sworn his sword to a single lord for too long. Besides, he died decades ago. Grunbeld was the legendary Flame Dragon Knight of Grant that held off a massive Tudor assault with just 3,000 men. But that too was a long time ago, and Mule had heard he'd died as well. When he walked through the War Demon section of Griffith's war camp, Lord Wolfflame could sense that there was something off about these people. He hadn't seen a monster yet, but he didn't need to see one to sense its presence. His guard shot all the way up on the final stretch of his journey to meeting his savior, but when he got there, all his worries melted away and were replaced by a sense of serenity and reverence. Mule walked in on Griffith, controlling what appeared to be balls of light that turned out to be the souls of the men that had died in his service. After every fight, Griffith would use his powers as a god hand on earth to separate the souls of his fallen soldiers from their bodies and send them to a place where they became one. Such a thing was unheard of in the physical world, and because no one living in Holy Sea territory had an iota of a clue about what that singularity could refer to, no one even bothered to question it. If they had, they'd have realized what he really meant was he's adding the soldier's soul to that vortex within the abyss, so that even in death, they would continue to serve his dream. And it's this disgusting soul-stealing, dressed up as miraculous deliverance, is central to Griffith being accepted as a divine savior by the humans of this world. You see priests bless people and read out funeral rites on a daily basis, but you never see any of it causing any tangible change in a person. With this soul resting ceremony, Griffith was able to show people that everything they believed about the afterlife was true, because he was giving them evidence of an afterlife even existing in the first place. Once he convinced them of that, they wouldn't bother asking him where those souls actually went to, because they would simply trust in his divine authority. Mule asked him that question before he was bedazzled by Griffith's magnetic odd, and we wish he'd have persisted with it, because if he had, it would have blown Griffith's game wide open way before things went his way. But that isn't what causality wanted, because after seeing this miracle, Mule, like most people, was overcome with a sense of reverence for Griffith, and he placed his sword to the Falcon without even really realizing what he was doing. Mule was conscious of the fact that he didn't know Griffith, that this devotion he was feeling wasn't something he came up with, yet he accepted the great tide of destiny that flew from the Falcon's very being and allowed himself to get swept up in it. As a reward for helping his band resupply, Griffith named Mule Sonya's protector, and this was the duo that actually brought the pontiff to Griffith for his confirmation. His logic for adding Kushan defectors to his ranks and also adopting the war slaves tactic to an extent felt unsound for Midland loyalists but made perfect sense for anyone that got his global agenda. If Griffith wanted to rule the world, he needed to make all types of people coexist with each other in peace, if not complete harmony. So he had to start somewhere, and by giving his Kushan captives like Jafar positions of note within his army after they'd served their term, improved Griffith's optics in comparison to his enemy at the time, because his enemy didn't care about coexistence as much as putting the world underneath his thumb. Emperor Ganeshka was a ruler that had lived his entire life obsessing over victory, quite like Griffith. The only difference is, unlike Griffith, he was royalty, and he'd been conquering other nations since the age of 18. You can find out more about him from our anatomy video on the guy, but suffice it to say that because of his past as a ruler, he continued to walk that path even after he became an apostle. Usually, apostles are supposed to be naturally subservient to the God Hand, but Ganeshka resisted that in favor of desecrating the God Hand with his own. He wanted the world in his palms, and to that extent he used dark sorcery to create legions of demonic soldiers and beasts that made his conquest rapid and savage beyond imagination. Ganeshka had captured Princess Charlotte early on in his invasion of Midland. He captured the entire coastline of Vritanis in a single night with his sneaky infiltration tactics. He personally was stronger than every apostle in existence, even the immortal one, which was proved when he fought Zod at Vritanis Bay. 
and because Ganishka had little regard for how he portrayed himself at this point, he turned all territories under his occupation into real-life hellscapes, further cementing his image as a demon king. In comparison to him, Griffith felt even more like a savior to the people he helped liberate all across Midland, and the Falcon was smart about using his war demons early on. He made sure that they never assumed their released forms in battles they needed to fight alongside their human counterparts, and if there were missions that needed their released forms, Griffith would arrange for those to occur clandestinely. For example, his plan to rescue Princess Charlotte involved only two units, the War Demon's Archer unit and the Lancer unit. Both of them served as distractions whilst Griffith used Zod to break Charlotte out of the Tower of Rebirth. Now, if he'd taken human soldiers with him on this mission, he'd have to explain why a massive black lion with horns was his steed of choice, not his pearl-white Pegasus-like horse. That isn't even bringing up the fact that the rest of his soldiers seemed monstrous as well. When Griffith sent Zod to Vritanis to confront Ganishka, he did it as a strength-gauging measure. He wanted to know what he was working with, so he only used Zod's aerial unit to assault Ganishka the very night he tried to invade the city of Vritanis. His quick thinking and the circumstantial, uh, sorry, causal presence of guts helped the Falcon force a stalemate before he personally arrived to smooth things over politically. Once he'd established himself as the savior of mankind thanks to the pontiff's arrival, the news that Princess Charlotte had betrothed herself to Griffith and named him sole commander of Midland's regular army was accepted by everyone gathered, supporters and detractors alike. Shortly after he secured his iron grip over the forces of every Holy See territory, plus Midland's armies and his war demons, Griffith decided it was time to personally confront Ganishka and bring about the Age of Darkness in earnest. This is where our point about the God Hand needing a twice reincarnated apostle becomes relevant, and we'll explain how. After saving Britannis from Ganishka's nighttime assault, Griffith also protects it from the follow-up daytime assault, but this time he involves himself in the response and goes right up to Ganishka's mobile palace. The Dread Emperor loses his cool upon seeing the Falcon because while his consciousness wants to kill him and take over the world, his subconscious subservience to the God Hand made him want to kneel in his God's presence instead. Ganishka tried to fight Griffith and assumed his mist form, but the Falcon summoned the gust of the ocean itself and blew away all the mist the Emperor had gathered, bringing him to his knees. Griffith then proposed that they settle their battle at Wyndham, because the way he saw it, they were at a stalemate. Ganishka's assault had failed, but Griffith couldn't defeat his entire army with the numbers he currently had. Why didn't they both take some time off and recuperate before the final battle to decide the fate of the world? Ganishka jumped on the opportunity for prep time considering how easily Griffith had caught him off guard just now, but by doing so, he unknowingly played into the God Hand member's hand. Ever since his incarnation, Griffith's presence in the world had been blurring the borders between the physical and the astral world. Where once it was hard for humans to even see elves like Puck, they were now being harassed by packs of trolls and ogres and kelpies and such. In the area near Enoch Village, the astral world's womb of darkness found its way into the physical world. It took Guts the help of all of his new comrades and Skull Knight to close down Clipoth before it ran rampant, but the point is, the two worlds that generally overlap were now colliding into one. But that process wouldn't be complete without opening a certain door. And as it turns out, the door was supposed to be an apostle that had reincarnated twice, because the second incarnation links them deeply to the bowels of the astral world, from which Griffith could then draw out the Great Roar. That might have sounded more confusing than it needed to, so uh, we'll simplify it. Femto coming into the physical world as Griffith loosened up the borders between the physical and astral worlds, but it wasn't enough to break them. In order to achieve that, two ingredients were required. A space-cutting sword stroke that reached into the abyss, and a twice-reincarnated apostle whose body was connected to the abyss. The latter came in the form of Ganishka's Shiva form, which he acquired after lowering himself into the man-made behelot and forcing an artificial re-reincarnation. We'll explain the former in a few moments, and you can find out more about this form once again from our video on Ganishka's anatomy. But up until this point, Griffith had kept his war demons from transforming in front of his human soldiers, and when they did need to transform, they were sent out on apostle-only missions. With Ganishka's Shiva form, though, he needed all the soldiers available to him at max power, especially because Shiva could spawn pseudo-apostles from every organic life form he crushed with his feet. So when they started rushing his ranks, Griffith sent in his war demons first and commanded them to assume their released forms. Every last human on his side questioned his true nature when this happened because all this while they had no idea they were fighting alongside demons. Many of them started asking the right questions about Griffith's intentions because if he was willing to work with demons like this, what was he really planning for the world? But this is where his foresight as a god hand comes in handy. His plan for the world works out in his favor and his seer steps in to defend his honor. 
Griffith had indulged Sonia's obsession with him long enough to know she would stand up for him whenever he was questioned, and he knew her powers well enough to know that she could change everyone's mind if she was compelled to do so. Seeing all the humans in the Band of the Falcon panic at the sight of the war demon's real forms sent Sonia into a rage, and she connected everyone present via thought transference. She chastised them for thinking of themselves when Griffith was trying to save them, and her impassioned speech roused their faltering spirits and rallied the troops. Once she charged into the foray herself, every last man felt sorry that they'd just let a little girl go out there and do their jobs for them, and for the first time in human history, apostles and men fought side by side. The effects of Sonya's speech would have been temporary had the aftermath of the battle kept the world itself at a status quo. Fighting alongside monsters to take out a monster was logical, but would that logic stand when one side was eradicated? Griffith knew well what would happen if the world was left the way it was at that moment, and besides, he wasn't being able to utilize the full scope of his powers in the physical world. In order to do that, he'd have to bring the astral world to the physical, merge the two and return the Earth to the way it was during King Geyseric's era, the state of Fantasia. By putting the world back into a position where magical beasts became a threat once again, Griffith would not only be able to justify the continued existence of his war demons, but also affect the world on a much larger scale. As a god hand, he was one of the strongest astral entities in existence, and his influence over that space was immense. Right now, he was performing deeds akin to miracles, but if he had access to things like, say, the pathways of the astral world, he could teleport to anywhere he wanted and make himself seem even more like Berserk Jesus, which is what ends up happening. And when his human soldiers were concerned with fighting off cockatrices, trolls, ogres and worse on a daily basis, they'd be thankful for the war demons, not apprehensive of them. The Falcon of Darkness had taken every possible factor into account before taunting Ganeshka into his final showdown. So when it happened, he was ready to set the stage for his destiny. After his entire band engaged Shiva's pseudo-apostles, Griffith flew to the creature's head with Zod in order to trigger the Great Roar. We mentioned a few moments ago that the two ingredients he'd need were a twice-reincarnated apostle and a spatial sword strike. The former was clearly Ganeshka, but the latter was something that was akin to a double-edged sword for Griffith himself. The sword strike we're referring to comes from Skull Knight's Sword of Actuation, which he specifically created in order to entomb the God Hand within the Abyss. The foe of the Inhumans had used this blade on one occasion, when he saved Guts from a collapsing Clipoth, but that was enough to let him know that his blade worked. Skull Knight saved Guts from getting swallowed up by the chaos of a disintegrating Clipoth by cutting through separate layers of the astral world, navigating them in order to reach safety. The rest of the chaos went to the Abyss with the strike he fired off in the middle of its core. So, in theory, Skull Knight's sword worked, and it should have worked on any God Hand member that didn't have spatial powers. Unfortunately for him, Femto had both that and the benefit of being far better at interpreting causality. When Griffith arrived at the tip of Shiva's head, he assumed his released form and soothed the Dread Emperor in his mania. He promised that the light he so craved was finally here to set him free, but just then, Skull Knight ambushed him. The assault was so quick that even Zod couldn't react within time. Skull Knight fired off a one-way ticket to the Abyss in Griffith's direction, but to his shock, the Falcon blocked it. Not only that, he molded the strike into an infinity shape while speaking the words to the prophecy that foretold this very moment. Skull Knight's sword strike, which sent its targets to the Abyss and Shiva's body, which was linked to it from within, clashed with each other to put the Earth into a global interstice. When that happened, Shiva's body turned into the world spiral tree, a physical manifestation of the astral world's dragon path. The rest of the world saw magical beasts appear from within the shadows and Wyndham itself was no longer the city that it had been in recent centuries. It was replaced with the necropolis said to reside underneath the Tower of Rebirth, but it had been transformed since those days, designed to reflect its new owner, the Falcon of Light. Once the great roar of the astral world was complete, Griffith simply pointed his followers to the direction of their new home, and just like that, Falconia was born, the capital of the new world. In this new world, Griffith was king in all but name. He was the supreme commander of Midland's regular army, which, considering that it was now the epicenter of the world, meant he was the leader of all human and apostle forces. With his prophetic powers and ability to work miracles, he became the axis around which the Holy See rotated. His seer, Sonia, became the See's official high priestess, and Griffith's mass funerals became a public event that further reinforced his citizens' belief in his divinity. You recall that problem we mentioned regarding apostles and humans being forced to coexist? Well, Griffith knew that at some point his black sheep would become impatient, so he made them a dome-shaped colosseum called Pandemonium, where they could fight captured monsters to their heart's content and have them for brunch later. The old councillors of Midland were stuck in damage control mode as they pored over the finances and the current condition of their previous territories in council. But Griffith inspired them to think more universally, 
and supported reforms that put Falconia front and center as the focus of mankind in the new world. He proposed military arrangements for criminals and educational programs for citizens that would indoctrinate them with a sense of loyalty to Falconia itself. He established several guilds which allowed craftsmen and blacksmiths to ply their trade without worrying about restrictions like budgetary and physical constraints. In a very short time, Griffith had turned Falconia into a center of culture and vibrancy, and everyone on the outside world bought into this vision when they decided to come to the city to escape their astral troubles. But the truth was, this utopia was not without its lapses, the biggest of which was the fact that it was built upon the blood and bones of thousands of innocent people, including Griffith's former comrades. Don't you think it's a little weird no one asks Griffith where his former bandmates are? A few of his council members run into the survivors of the Eclipse, but none of them question why they aren't with Griffith. We think it's because of the enchanting effect he has on people, which basically keeps them from asking the questions that they would otherwise be asking themselves. Because Owen met both Guts and Rickett after the Eclipse, but he wasn't able to figure out why either man had abandoned a leader that was akin to a savior to him. Falconia might have been a beacon of hope in an age of darkness, but it wasn't without its faults, as heresy and crime were both on the rise in the city's outskirts. Like the Jotnar, because he claimed that he was reclaiming living space for all humans. When he put it that way, his counselors thought him a benevolent savior, when what he really meant was, I control you humans, so I need more space to pen you all up inside of. Everything Griffith says and does as the leader of Falconia is built upon a lie, because the souls he delivers go into the abyss. The soldiers he relies on might eat up his subjects on any given day, and all the monster problems he's solving exist because he created them in the first place. And if there was an ounce of self-awareness in any of the humans that lived in his castle, they'd have at least thought that something was wrong with their leader if his former comrade was slapping him without a care for who was watching. When Griffith visited Guts and Rickard upon the Hill of Swords, he told Guts he didn't care what the swordsman did, but he told Rickard that if he still shared Griffith's dream after learning the truth, then he should seek him out and rejoin his ranks. Rickett didn't come to Falconia because he wanted to take up the offer. He was there because he wanted to protect his companion, Erica. But because he was recognized as a former Falcon, he was given a special pass to meet with Griffith. And when he met Griffith, all Rickett wanted to do was slap the guy and reject his proposal. Rickett told Griffith flat out that he wasn't the guy that used to lead him anymore. And that slap meant more than anyone watching even realized it did. Because despite being human, Ricky had just struck a god hand. Rickett is chased out of Falconia by assassins that we don't know if Griffith sent behind him or not, but this incident showed us as readers that at least within him, morality still existed. If you were to read any of the chapters following the conviction arc, you'd have a hard time trying to understand if Griffith was a hero or a villain, because Miura intentionally kept his dialogue and internal thought processes off-panel. Instead, he showed us characters reacting to Griffith's actions, and those reactions are usually pretty reverent which is why he comes off as an actual messiah to some people. But if you're like Rickett, then you know the true foundation of his messianic power, and you too would slap him across the face for acquiring that by sacrificing your mutual friends. Rickett escapes Falconia, and Griffith evidently doesn't make any attempt at chasing him down, because he's got bigger fish to fry. Following the Great Roar, the Falcon's dream was finally actually becoming a reality. He had the castle, the girl to legitimize his claim, the power to make anything happen, and the blind support of all of his people. His strength was unopposed, yet he kept performing a new miracle each day. Soon enough, he'd be married to Charlotte by the pontiff himself, at which point he would truly become king of the world, especially given the rate at which Falconia was growing. So what exactly can go wrong with his carefully constructed master plan, the one for which he changed the world itself? Well, the fact that every full moon night he turned into a literal baby, and the only way he could control it was by living with the woman he once tossed aside like a used toy covering his fatal floor and preparing for the final unholy war, why Griffith kidnapped Casca and plans to head east. So you know how we told you guys that when Griffith visited the Hill of Swords, he got confirmation that his heart was frozen and he could proceed with his plans without involving petty human emotion in them. Well, we didn't give you the entire picture, because as it happens, that's a half-truth. Griffith's heart is frozen, yeah, that's true. The man that was the White Falcon certainly feels nothing when he sees people like Guts and Rickard again. But his isn't the only heart within his incarnated vessel. That body is shared by Guts and Casca's demon child. See, the incarnation ceremony was supposed to see the egg of the perfect world give Griffith a physical body, and only Griffith. But what he ended up doing is he swallowed Guts and Casca's demon child, whom he found dying in one of the balconies of the Tower of Conviction. When he saw the kid, the egg empathized with it, saw himself in it, and so he swallowed it and told it to patiently dream of the new world's arrival within his womb. When the incarnation ceremony's blood flow entered the egg's body, 
That womb quickened, and the deformed child were then matured into a human baby, and then into the adult body of Griffith. The Falcon of Light's body is shared by this child now, and while he's devoid of feelings, the kid isn't. And they spring out most often when he's around his mother, Casca. When Griffith visited Guts and Rickard on the Hill of Swords, he made no move to interrupt the former's battle with Zod. But when that battle put Casca in danger, the demon child within him made him move to protect her. This stunned Griffith, who thought his heart should have been frozen by now, so he left immediately afterward. When he placed his hand on his chest, he felt a beating, and he realized that this was the demon child's heart he was feeling. He also realized this was going to be a problem for him, because every full moon, the child would take over their shared vessel and transform into the Moonlight Boy. This boy would track down its mother and spend the night covered in nostalgic warmth, but by the morning, it would return to Falconia, and all that remained of the entire experience was a fleeting sense of longing that was felt by Griffith himself. The Falcon knew that him disappearing for an entire night when he wanted to run a global empire was going to be a big problem, especially when he didn't even know if the Moonlight Boy was vulnerable to immortal weapons or not. After letting it happen a couple of times, he decided he was going to address the problem by capturing the root cause of it, and that's when he decided to kidnap Casca. It coincided with him visiting a place that was on his to destroy list anyway, so it was a win-win scenario for Griffith. Since he came back to the physical world, Griffith had been hard at work destroying every other anchor to the astral world that he thought would end up diminishing his control over the world. This is why he attacks Flora's spirit tree mansion unprovoked, because he knows that one old witch is more dangerous than a million raving soldiers. After the great roar of the astral world, his control over the earth increased exponentially thanks to the world spiral tree's manifestation, but it also strengthened all other centers of power that shared the tree's spiritual energy from their shared garden. So Griffith employed a scorched earth policy to ensure his was the only tree left standing. Ending. One of the biggest spiritual anchors of the world resided on Skellig Island, which was home to the mages and the elves of Berserk, but Griffith himself had no way of accessing the island given his malicious nature. Elfhelm was protected by enchantments older than the God Hand itself, and only pure-hearted beings could enter it. That too, if the mages allowed them to. Griffith, the God Hand, was a malicious being by nature, but the Moonlight Boy wasn't. So when he arrived at Elfhelm seeking his mother, it gave the Falcon the best opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. Griffith kidnapped Casca and destroyed Elfhelm in quick succession, and brought her back with him to Falconia. In amongst all that, he humiliated Guts by using his god hand powers to avoid every blow he tried landing on his body with Dragon Slayer. With his enemy spirit completely broken, and the object that anchored his weakness in his possession, Griffith returned to Falconia, triumphant. He'd secured his transformational crisis, made Guts fall into a deep depression, and take out the biggest magical threat to his authority that remained in the new world. Technically, all his problems were solved, right? Well, not quite. Yes, Griffith secured his fatal flaw by kidnapping Casca, but now he had a new problem on his hands. Casca herself. To keep his former victim taciturn, Griffith put her under some sort of mind spell which made her go about her days in a daze. In her new reality, Casca was an eminent Falconian noblewoman who lived in lavish quarters within the Falcon's castle, dined on steaks and played with orphans in the garden. But her true identity was always simmering beneath the surface, and whenever Casca snapped out of this trance, she'd always try to escape because, in her mind, she needed to get back to Guts. We have no idea how many times she tried breaking out of Falconia. We've only seen one such attempt, but we have no doubt it must have been more than that. The attendants that were surrounding Casca in this new life all seemed to be well-trained and instructed to spy on her for Griffith, so that when something went wrong, he could immediately intervene and shut it down. This is a very risky play by him, considering he's trying to convince everyone else he's berserk Jesus. One can only imagine how Charlotte would react when he finds out what he did to his former comrade. But that's just it. Will she even discover Casca's presence in Falconia? With every passing day, Griffith's control over his people increases, and it's tough to tell whether anyone in his group will realize what he's done to get them their freedom at this point. But what isn't tough to gauge is Griffith's next move, and the reason behind the same. In Chapter 372, the Falcon of Light tells his war demon captains that they're going to be heading east. The reason for this being, that is where the last known resistance to Griffith's authority currently exists. After escaping Falconia, Rickett joined up with the Kushan warrior Silat and sorcerer Daiba, flying back to Kushan territory with them. While there, he helped organize and outfit their military, became a part of it, and go to work on improving the crumbling empire's defenses. This is because the Kushan are now the only humans on Earth that know the truth about Griffith, that he's an evil demon king. They have enough human and magical soldiers on their side to pose a threat. 
now that Elfhelm survivors have arrived in Kushan lands, and they also have the Black Swordsman himself, though his participation in future campaigns remains tenuous at best. If he wants to rule over the world with an iron fist, Griffith needs to eliminate this pocket of resistance, and he needs to do that before his coronation, because we can sense that his marriage to Charlotte and his official ascension ceremony is going to be the climactic demonic event of Berserk. When Guts was asked by Guru Gedfring why Griffith would go to the extent of changing the world to achieve his dream, he replied by saying that building a kingdom was just the first step in the Falcon's conquest. Griffith would fly higher and higher from that point onward, because that's the kind of man he was. Becoming king isn't enough for him anymore. He wants to rule the entire world, and he can only do that when he has no enemies. Griffith once declared that he wanted to turn Falconia into a second rendition of Geyseric's worldwide empire, but how can he achieve that if he still has enemies standing up against him in the east? So, from a military perspective, it makes perfect sense for him to head east, and it also makes a lot of storyline sense as well. The eastern hemisphere of Berserk is one of its most mysterious aspects, and yet it's also been connected to many of its developments. The Slug Count got his behelot from an eastern bazaar. The most advanced magical beasts we see in the series are of eastern creation. Clearly, there's some kind of hidden knowledge over there, knowledge that Griffith could perhaps need to fulfill his true ambition. But standing in his way will be his old foes, and a face he'd hoped to forget a long time ago. Griffith was told that his destiny was to rule the world in exchange for his flesh when he was a child, and in a way, that has come true. But being the control freak he is, he doesn't realize it just yet, and he'll never be content with a crumb when he can have the whole cookie. The Falcon of Darkness plays a very delicate game of deception, because once he gets exposed for who he truly is, his utopia will come crumbling down. And it'll be in that moment that we'll get to see if Griffith has truly changed. Will he cope with that downfall with grace, or will he lash out once again? And put his insecurities on display for the whole world to see. Will his story end the way he wants it to end, or will some force that lies outside of the causal current deny him that destiny once again? We don't know the answers to these questions yet, but we hope to find out soon enough. One thing is clear though, it began in blood for Griffith, and it will end in blood as well. Marvelous verdict. And that was the entire life of the most narcissistic pretty boy in manga history. Griffith's life story is all about a man obsessed with power and the desire to change the world and make it bow down to his will. This makes him the most dangerous kind of man in existence, because he has no concept of accountability or letting go of things. Those traits helped him rise up the social and political ladder, but they also got him tortured and his friends killed. And in the end, he didn't even give them the courtesy of mourning them, even after visiting their graves. That's the kind of man he truly is. But that's our case study of one of manga's greatest villains. What do you guys think? Let us know in the comments down below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, keep struggling, strugglers.